Thank you, everybody. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Crystal Market Intelligence and Analytics Consulting and all my colleagues here, I warmly welcome all of you present here and joining us online to the fourth edition of Crystal India Infrastructure Conclave 2023. I am Guranchal Singh, Associate Director, Crystal Consulting, and I'll be your host for today. Crystal launched its annual in Crystal India Infrastructure Conclave 2017 in uh, 2017, the Conclave is a thought leadership platform bringing together policymakers, industry leaders, and other stakeholders to stimulate and yield ideas that drive India's infrastructure build out. The previous editions of the Conclave dwelled upon the role of private sector and states in India's infrastructure building. The theme for this year's event is Building and Financing Sustainable Infrastructure. Today, we plan to dwell deep into the need for maintaining the momentum in infrastructure investments while reducing the impact on the environment. We shall discuss upon building green urban infrastructure, promoting sustainable mobility and transportation, and identifying avenues and opportunities for green capital investments. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an exciting lineup of sessions planned for you today. So without any further delay, I would request Mr. Amish Mehta Managing Director and CEO, Crystal Limited, to commence the proceedings for the day. Over to you, Amish. Good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to this edition of the Crystal Infrastructure Conclave. Uh, thank you for taking the time out today from your busy schedule, uh, and I hope you have an enriching session. Special thanks to Sri Nitin Gadkariji and all the illustrious panelists who are going to join us today uh, for attending this program. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have a, a valuable time uh, learning and taking some great perspectives from, uh, from the minister and from the panelists and during the course of the day. Uh, that would be par for the course because uh, India is seeing what is arguably the greatest infrastructure build out in memory. Um, there is much more to come and I think we have just begun our journey of, of, of building infrastructure for this economy. City after city, town after town, village after village are seeing improvements in infrastructure including connectivity, uh, access to basics and other facilitations. Anyone who chronicles all these changes will have a bestseller for sure. Without much ado, let me come to my uh, presentation. So as economic multipliers grow, nothing quite beats in investment in infrastructure. A study by SNP uh, Global Ratings in 2017 indicates that infrastructure spending has a GDP multiplier of two times for India. Data from the Government of India shows such spending engenders a GDP multiplier of 2.45 in the year of capital expenditure and 3.14 in the following year. We at Crystal are forecasting that infrastructure spending would nearly double in the seven fiscals to 2030 from an estimated 67 lakh crore to uh, between 17 and, and 2023 to 143 lakh crore between fiscals 24 and 2030. Just imagine the multiplier effect of all of that including the population scale leaps in digital infrastructure through the UPI and the Jam Trinity, which have become models for the world to emulate. Crystal forecasts India's GDP to grow at an average of 6.7% from this fiscal through 2031. So from, 30, uh, from 24 to 31, we are expecting the average to be at 6.7% and making us the fastest growing large economy. Our per, per capita income will increase during that period from 2,500 currently to $4,500 by then. Once we cross the $4,000 per threshold, we become a middle income country. What does this large scale enhanced physical infrastructure do for us? It improves connectivity, it lowers the logistics costs, and it remains key to the success of manufacturing sector and India's exports led growth strategy. Infrastructure investments also provides a boost to the construction sector, which is among the most labor-intensive sectors in India. Various studies have shown 
that improved access to markets on account of enhanced transport infrastructure has a strong positive impact on employment generation. So the transformational build out we have seen or we have been seeing needs to continue spurred by supportive policies and regulatory environment. Importantly, facilitations for where, wherewithal and of course effective implementation. So I think regulatory environment and effective implementation are going to be the need of the hour. Uh, you know, how we want to scale this up. The other important flank is social infrastructure, uh, health, education, san sanitation, and we need to accelerate the build out there as well with equal if not more focus. Digital infrastructure enhancements are just as necessary to support growth, create employment and reduce poverty. The way we have been going, it is no surprise that our policies and experience are attracting global attention. We are now offering great learnings for other countries to consider and emulate. These could be best practices with regard to policy frameworks or funding models or creating favorable investment climate in sectors such as renewable energy, urban infrastructure and transport. In the renewable space, for one, India has been playing a leading role in the International Solar Alliance and the International Biofuels Alliance announced at the G20 summit recently. If we move to the next slide, we see some clear trends playing out through fiscal 2030. First, a sharp focus for integrating sustainability with infrastructure development. This would be one of the biggest themes in infrastructure space with increased awareness and climate related targets putting all stakeholders including governments, regulatory agencies, lenders, private sector, developers, suppliers and contractors on notice. Of the total projected expenditure infrastructure spend between fiscals 2024 and 2030 of rupees 36.6 lakh crore is expected to be green investments a five time rise over the fiscals 2017 to 2023. That's right, five times increase in the spend on green investments in the infrastructure space alone. Integration is likely to happen across the value chain from incorporating sustainability uh, related aspects within the project design to adopting best practices for ensuring a safe work environment at the site to establishing responsible sourcing of materials. Second, increasing size and ambition of projects. As and when with fast growing large and mature economy, the next phase of our infrastructure development will be shaped by growth in the average ticket size of projects and a significant number of mega projects. Uh, to name a few, the giga factories, the solar parks, modernization of railways, bullet train projects with Ahmedabad, Mumbai road projects like Delhi Mumbai Expressway, the Ganga Expressway uh, and scaling up capacities at airports such as the Delhi airport which will soon be able to handle 100 million passengers annually. Two new greenfield airports in Jewar and Navi Mumbai with peak capacity of 120 and 90 million respectively showcase India's rising scale and ambition. We expect the best practices and key learnings from such projects to trickle down to the wider infrastructure space helping optimize investments in the coming years. If we move to the next slide, uh, you know, continued policy and regulatory ev evolution. The government has ensured our policies respond to the needs of sectors with evolving challenges of size changing technological landscape and business models. This has been especially prominent in sectors like solar and wind energy. Additionally, the PM Gati Shakti has and is expected to improve coordination amongst various ministries responsible for infrastructure development, bringing coherence for faster clearances, approvals for projects and foster greater efficiency in project execution. Initiatives such as single video window clearances channeling of funding, timely payment to private sector through improvement in operational discipline by levying late payment surcharge to state discoms, streamlining of mining auction process for mining assets, reducing leakages through fast tag implementation in road sector and PLI schemes are further expected to be key growth drivers. Government support has, a key, has been a key driver of India's infrastructure investments. For the current fiscal, the government announced an additional gross budgetary support of 10 lakh crore for further support and develop infrastructure development taking the total support up 37% vis-a-vis fiscal 2023. Moving to the next slide, rising scale and diversity of funding. Over the past few years, we have seen an uptick in availability of funds as well as a diversification in the avenues of fundraising. Availability of long-term funding, both debt and equity is expected to increase with greater involvement of entities such as the National Investment and Infrastructure Fund, National Bank for Financing, Infrastructure and Development, non-banks such as Power Finance Corporation, Rural Electrification, Electrification Corporation and Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency and through INVITS, sovereign funds and green bonds. 
India's first sovereign green bond issuance will pave the way for the development of the domestic bond market for green issuances. The government raised 16,000 crores via the first sovereign green bonds in two tranches in January and February this year. Over the past few years, global experience has shown increasing appetite for green assets amongst investors, leading to Indian companies seeking funds in global markets. The demand is expected to materialize in the domestic market also in the coming years. As of 2022, estimates put India's outstanding green social sustainability linked bonds issuance at $20 billion. One, one of the outcomes of seeking funds through green instruments is the need to ensure transparency in reporting and integrity of disclosures. Consequently, SEBI and RBI have come out with a slew of guidelines and mandates to help improve the reporting regime of Indian corporates and augment the credibility of market participants. Recently, JP Morgan announced the inclusion of India's local bonds in the Government Bond Index Emerging Markets Index. And this is at expected to attract 25 to 30 billion dollar inflows, helping deepen the bond market in India and reducing the cost of capital going forward. There has also been a concerted effort to push for reforms at multilateral development banks to ensure greatest access to funds and promote investment in new technology through first loss guarantee structures in addition to driving entity reforms and capacity building. Let me touch upon interest rates here for it is, it is pertinent at this point of time. The rise in interest rates globally has had little impact in foreign inter investor interest in Indian assets. But then returns from infrastructure investments typically span many economic cycles and interest rate cycles, so there's little to worry on that count. India remains a compelling long-term opportunity for global capital. However, the cost for infrastructure developers that depend on overseas borrowings could mount given the higher interest rates, maybe higher interest rates for longer is what is being spoken as we, as we look at the current environment. Sharper focus on green and sustainable projects as well as improving economics and expectations of continued growth are expected to offset the negative externalities of higher interest rates. Moving to the next slide, Indians are increasingly parking their money in financial instruments in a break from their prosperity for investment in physical assets such as real estate and valuables. Over the seven years through fiscal 2030, financial investments are expected to log a CAGR of 17.4%, faster than 12.5% CAGR of bank deposits. Total financial investments would be Rs 480 trillion that year, more than triple the current estimated amount driven by mutual funds, retirement funds and insurance segment. This will help further deepen the debt and equity markets in India to help finance the infrastructure requirement. Moving on to the next slide, um, deleveraged balance sheets of banks and private sectors can be an enabler. Following write-offs of bad loans via the National Asset Reconstruction Company Limited and resolution by the National Company Law Tribunal, banks and non-banks are now in a comfortable position to further lend to the infrastructure sector. We have seen banks record decadal low gross non-performing assets at 3.9% as of fiscal 23 with a healthy capital adequacy ratio of 17.1. Uh, this puts banks in a very favorable position to be able to lend uh, for, for larger projects for longer durations. And additionally, corporate balance sheets have improved significantly over the last five fiscals. Uh, this is also reflected in our crisis ratings actions with infrastructure linked sectors accounting for 29% of all upgrades in the first half of 2024. Let me move to the next slide. Uh, in this milieu, what can be done to accelerate infrastructure investments? We see robust policy and regulatory support remaining a focus area for the government. Ensuring land availability and coordinated center and state policy framework will help improve the ease of doing business quotient further. Strong regulatory oversight and response to changing market sector dynamics will help ensure the business models stay viable. One recent example of this is the Ministry of Civil In Aviation Initiative that called upon states to reduce the value added tax on air turbine fuel. In response, 19 states have taken steps to reduce VAT rates on the ATF. Also critical is continued support for scaling up sustainable urban infrastructure, mobility solutions and emerging technologies. Regulatory evolution and clarity in actions like carbon market development, renewable energy and integration in the grid, Production-linked incentive scheme for the electric value, vehicle value chain and energy storage will ensure we build further on the momentum already generated in these segments. 
balancing growth and environment concerns ensuring a smooth and just transition from fossil fuels will be important too we believe strong performance of operational assets in a healthy demand scenario can help showcase robust business models build investor confidence and boost capital inflow timely monetization of assets would be important the national monetization pipeline is expected to be another critical success factor the last few years have seen advent of innovative in monetization models such as the toll operate transfer the tot the invits infrastructure investment trust real estate investment trust reits and toll securitization that help generate cash flow for funding new projects these schemes have been have seen a mixed response so far with 10 road invits four reits listed publicly and five of the 12 tot tenders floated being awarded the pace of monetization will have to accelerate to ensure funding gaps are addressed for future projects continued evolution of asset monetization models will be necessary to ensure timely flow of funds and provide exits to existing investors private sector participation remains an imperative the past few years have seen selective participation of private companies in infrastructure through improved financing models such as hybrid annuity model and improved norms for land acquisition about 90% have helped improve investor confidence though small compared with public investments private investments will be a key driver in the next few years but we need to look out for factors that could derail this infrastructure investment this would include execution delays on account of late regulatory clearances or permissions across the life cycle of the project involving multiple local bodies many of which operate independently and do not coordinate with other agencies or institutions slow reaction of regulatory authorities slow response to changes in market dynamics can render the business model unsustainable cost of funding this is a key monetable given the scale of investment the prominent impact it has on viability of business models and the geopolitical risk uh, we can keep an eagle eye on this as it could have a drastic impact on the commodity prices and thus raise input cost uh, the current environment has multiple challenges on the geopolitical side which could have an impact on the on the funding on capital flows on commodity prices inflation interest rates i think this could be something which could have an impact over the longer term if we move on uh, coming to crisis proprietary infra invex index which tracks and assesses development maturity and investment attractiveness of key infrastructure sec sectors i am happy to inform there has been an improvement in almost all sectors compared with the last time sectors such as renewable energy railways and power are seeing improvements of over 15% driven by reforms and improvement in financial metrics this time around four sectors roads and highways power transmission renewable energy and ports are leading sectors with a score of greater than 7 out of 10 you are going to hear more about this during the during the later part of the day given the criticality of infrastructure in realizing india's goal to be a 5 trillion dollar economy the need of the r is to continue the reform momentum to address challenges of scaling up address implementation issues ensure funding availability and driving environment friendly build out to ensure better life for future generations once again thank you and let me now hand it back to granchal thank you Thank you, Amish, for setting the context for the day. Taking cues from Amish's speech, we embark on our journey of exploring the blending of economic and infrastructural growth with sustainability and availability of green finance through a fireside chat. It is my privilege to invite Dr. Auguste Tano Kwame, Country Director, India, World Bank, on the stage. Dr. Kwame is a champion on climatic agenda and economic management. I would also like to invite Mr. Dharam Kirti Joshi, DK, as he is fondly known, Chief Economist Crystal, to conduct this chat. Over to you, DK. Hey, DK. Good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here and uh, you, for taking time out uh, for doing this for us. Sure. Well, I was. Uh, I think one of the things that always uh, comes to my mind is what uh, Robert Lucas had said mm -hmm. a couple of uh, years back that uh, when you start talking about thinking about growth, it's very difficult to think about anything else. Yeah. And this has been quoted everywhere, including your uh, uh, long-term uh, growth report. Yeah. Uh, but I promise we'll talk more. I think we'll also tilt towards development, not just focus on 
on growth. But let me start with growth. I think the, the, the World Bank annual meetings, World Bank fund annual meetings have just been over. Thank you. And uh, uh, so what is the current assessment? Uh, because assessments keep changing as the risks are, are, are moving, uh, moving around. Uh, and how is India placed in that overall scenario, which is playing out this year? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ike. Do I need to use this mic? Or no, you, it's... Thank you. Thank you very much, Ike. So indeed, um, growth is uh, very important, including for development. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to get to development uh, without growth. Um, and indeed, growth was a big part of the conversation in Marrakech. Um, so, you know, I should uh, not forget to thank you, but also to thank Chrisil for associating us to this event and give us a chance to share our thoughts uh, on the Indian economy with you, but also on the global economy. So in, in Marrakesh, one of the important things that come about, you know, both in the presentations that were made by the World Bank and the IMF was what I would call the structural decline in growth globally uh, since the beginning of this decade. Uh, you know, the, in the first decade of the 21st century, global average growth was 3.5%. In the second decade, it went down to 26 In the third decade, we're now talking about 22 For this coming year, the global growth will be 2.1, 2.2, um, which is very low. Uh, and it's a decline across almost all income groups. Uh, and it is surely higher growth it will be higher for developing countries and because they need to grow but it is not sufficient to eradicate poverty and our new at the world bank our new vision now is to uh, eliminate poverty on a livable planet and our mission is to eliminate poverty boost shared prosperity on a livable, livable planet we cannot do that if developing countries are not growing so there is a big concern about growth uh, globally uh, and we know why growth is slow, at least for this de decade. You know, uh, Amish mentioned many of the factors. Geopolitical uh, is one of the reasons that the world is not growing. There are too many tensions, so putting pressure on prices or availability of commodities and clogging uh, uh, global value chains, uh, breaking them actually, disrupting them, uh, and, and creating fear of, among investors. Uh, then there is the issue of... Uh, the cost of funding, because interest, uh, inflation is high, central banks are trying to fight, to fight inflation, and in fighting inflation, they ra they've raised in interest rates, which increases the cost of, uh, of, of development, of doing development work, because you need to borrow to finance your development if you're a developing country. Um, so there are all these uh, global issues, and of course, there is COVID that, uh, that hurt. You know, many countries have recovered, luckily. Um, and there is a fear of, you know, other, you know, um, uncertainties around uh, forecast. So the world is not growing. Um, but within that context, there are a few countries that are doing very well, and India is one of them. Uh, India has shown strong resilience to uh, these uh, uh, global headwinds. Um, last year, uh, India grew at 7.2%, uh, which was twice the average for the emerging market economies, and it was the second highest growth rate among uh, G20 countries. Our forecasts show that there will grow, India will grow at 6.3 percent in the in, in, in this year, uh, and 6.3 percent is slightly lower than 7.2, but it will make India the fastest growing large uh, economy in the world, um, in a context where the world is growing only at barely two percent. So this is uh, this is very praiseworthy. Having said that, it would be nicer if we had a better global environment so that India could grow even faster in that global environment. So I think uh, uh, taking that a little further, uh, can we make the global growth faster? Is there any possibility or is it uh, greater compliance? I, I, we are optimistic. We think that there will be a better world. Uh, there ought to be a better world uh, because if there is no better world, it will be a fragmented world. It will be a world where the young people in the global south will not find jobs. And if they don't find jobs, they're not an asset. They can become a liability for their respective countries and therefore for the world. Um, if there is no sufficient growth going around, it will intensify tensions among countries uh, globally. Um, so there ought to be a better world. That's why you know, I was uh, 
very happy to see how the G20 summit here uh, went in Delhi, where the leaders, uh, or the most important leaders of the world, uh, in terms of economic weight, came together and realized that you know we need to work together to solve global issues, wherever they are, because a good context anywhere is a good context for everyone, for, from the growth point of view, uh, from the export point of view, for you know it creates market for everyone. So. There will be a better world. Uh, we just don't know when. Um, and, uh, and when that global environment improves uh, through you know, uh, less, perhaps less geopolitical tensions and maybe interest rate will come down. You know, there is no way interest rate will remain where they are today. They will go down at some point. Um, countries are going to invest more, investing more in education and health. And those will improve the context, uh, the global context. Uh, so what can be done specifically to do that? I think first to recognize that there are, there are externalities and you know, we should not um, forget that the actions we take in our respective economies also have an impact on the global economy. So do, for example, we should see less trade restrictions. In the past three years, countries globally have taken more than 2,000 trade restriction measures. This is unhealthy. And that shrinks the global economy is not growing, but when you have trade restrictions everywhere, it shrinks the space within which each country can grow. It reduces my ability to tap into what other countries are doing well to, to strengthen my own growth, and therefore it also reduces their chances of benefiting my, from my own growth. So we're reducing the space within which countries can grow. The second thing we need to do uh, is uh, to find resources to invest where the return on investment is highest. In emerging market economies, the economies the return on investment is higher than in matured economies. So, finding more resources to invest in countries that can create more additional growth for the world is something that we should all focus on. Um, the third thing we should do is to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to invest in human capital uh, where uh, labor is. Because if you look at numbers, uh, in fact, at the global level, we should be concerned about the availability of workers. The population, global population is declining, especially in advanced economies and mostly there. Uh, population, the population is aging. Those countries will need workers. Where will the worker come from? They'll come from countries where we have young population. Uh, so invest in the skills globally for anywhere, anybody anywhere in the world is good for the global labor force. So find resources globally to invest in human capital will be uh, the third thing I will think about. So expand trade, invest more in return, uh, in where the investment, the return investment is higher, and invest in human capital. Yeah, I think completely agree with you on the trade. I mean, there's no winner there. I think the, person, the country which is levying a tariff it loses out. I guess. The country on which it is levied loses out. Yes. And the collateral damage is for countries which have done nothing. I mean, yes. so it, it actually is, uh, it's, it's, we need to see how it evolves, I think, yes. going ahead. Yeah. I think now coming back to India, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the, the growth rate so far has been good. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Amish mentioned about 6.7% growth mm -hmm. over the medium run. Now, uh, we've already grown at these rates earlier. Now, I think the size of the economy is larger. So uh, growing at 67 has more multiplier effects and more compounding mm -hmm. effects, so to say. Correct. But can we grow like East Asia or China? Eight percent. I mean, is there a possibility, or I think is this global context and the, 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 the domestic constraints? I think are going to keep us uh, on a on a lower. I mean, on a maybe six point seven percent, which is very respectable. I mean, by all all measures, mm -hmm. but maybe is not enough to take uh, uh, the kind of benefits that others have enjoyed. I mean, so other countries. Yes. So that's an interesting question. I think my short answer is yes. India can grow uh, at more than six point seven percent. Uh, India can grow at a higher rate, uh, and and I think there is also an, an impetus for India to grow at a higher rate. Uh, this being said, in today's global environment, uh, growing at 6.3% is very, very, very respectable, and it is probably uh, healthier to grow at 6.3% today than to grow at 10% in the global context in which we are. It's a, it can be a bit counterintuitive, but but you know when the context for you to grow at a higher rate is not there and you push growth to reach yeah. that point, you also create some other problems. Um, so today we estimate India's potential growth at about six to 6.5%. Uh, 
So that's the healthy zone for right. growth. And for India to, real, to be realizing that potential in a context that is unfriendly is a big achievement. Because normally when the context is not friendly, yeah. you cannot reach your potential. But today India is actually reaching its potential growth in a very, it, with a lot of headwinds yeah. globally. So that's very good. That's positive for the future. It means that if India could increase its potential growth to let's say 8%, then almost regardless of the global environment, India could achieve that potential growth. How to, and why I'm mentioning 8%, you know, in our estimations, uh, we find that if India were to achieve its goal of becoming a developed economy by 2047, this will require an average growth rate of 8% between now and 2047. And that 8% can be achieved if the global environment is super friendly, it will be achieved more easily. But if, on the other hand, India increases its own potential growth to 8%, then almost regardless of the global context, that potential growth can be achieved. And what is potential growth? We talked about Lucas earlier. Yeah. Potential growth is actually how you have prepared yourself right. uh, to grow and to prepare yourself in, in growth language. There are three things you can do. One is to invest more today yeah. so that tomorrow you can tap that investment to grow. And we're talking about a lot about infrastructure. So if you have one highway that allows you to grow at 6.3% uh, and you need a second one, to grow at 8%, until you build that second one, your growth is going to be constrained, by, you know, to stay at 6.3%. So when you grow the second one, then you increase your potential growth to reach 8%. So build that hard highway now, and that requires private investment, not just public investment. The, so that's on, on infrastructure, but also capital, you know, machinery, you know, and research and development. The second thing that is needed to increase potential growth is human capital. You know, if you have 50% of your workers that allow you to achieve 6.3%, and that's the maximum they can deliver for you, then if you want to grow at, to increase potential to 8%, you need to bring in part of the, the remaining 50%. Right? And the third thing is technology, yeah. efficiency, uh, you know, to make productivity higher. This requires different types of regulation. This requires different type of, types of interaction between, uh, between uh, economic uh, actors, it requires, you know, a, a few things. So, so, so those, those act factors of, that would boost potential growth, whilst we are now in an unfriendly global environment, this is the time to invest in them so that growth can be powered to 8% and beyond. If, you know, East, you mentioned East Asia, some of these countries grew at double digit. Now, is it possible for a large economy like India to grow at double digit? It is possible, but, but it is, you know, rich 8% allows India to achieve its goal, its own goals. And this, if this were to be achieved, I think it would be a very, very good thing for India. Yeah, so we'll soon get into the infra and the clean uh, infra part. But before that, I think one question which is very much debated in India is, uh, and government is trying to push manufacturing mm -hmm. sector as a leading engine, drawing from the experience of China and yes. others. But as you mentioned, the global environment is not that friendly. So mm -hmm. growing your way through exports is going to be a big yes. challenge. Now, in that environment, I mean, I mean, can India lean on manufacturing to that extent as the other countries did? Or will services continue to play a bigger role as they have in the last two decades? I think it will be both. It will be both. India has shown the world that actually this whole thing of deindustrialization yeah. is not necessarily bad. I mean, relying on services uh, is, you know, can be good. We saw during COVID when trade channels were closed, when economies were closed down and goods could not be exchanged because the ships had all stopped. India was able to export and trade with the rest of the world in services. And that's what the world needed the most. We all needed, you know, to connect from our homes and, yeah. you know, services, especially IT services, all of a sudden became very important. And today, if you look at the numbers, India's exports are doing very well on the services side. And that's one of the, on the supply side, is one of the drivers of growth that we're seeing today. So services is good. And India has invested a lot in uh, the digital public infrastructure. So it, it, it's helping export, but it's also helping the domestic economy. It's creating jobs. So I think going forward, and thanks to the uh, 
innovation that India is continuing uh, in services and IT, I think services are going to continue playing a big role in India. But, but that will not be enough if manufacturing remains uh, small. You know, the government has uh, uh, announced that you know, the share of manufacturing should grow to 25%. This is very good. This is a very good goal. And I think if this could be achieved, it, it will actually you know, help India grow at 8% at, at, at or even beyond. Right now, you know, depending on the number you believe in, services sector represent between 13 and, and 17%. Yeah. And, and that compares to, that's half of what China has. That's almost half of, about half of what Vietnam has. Uh, and so it's possible to increase the share of services to 25%. Uh, this requires a number of reforms, a number of investment. Uh, so short, to make long, long story short, services will have to play a very important role. They will have to continue. But manufacturing will have to increase its shares. It, it may not need to take that share from services. That, increase in manufacturing may come from reduction in the share of agriculture, which could be more efficient and produce more by using perhaps uh, you know, less, less resources. Right. Yeah. So that uh, brings us to the key challenge now. I think now if you are trying to grow your infrastructure, which India is doing, as Amish was pointing out, and you are also trying to grow your manufacturing, I think these are very carbon intensive sectors. Yes. And I think growing them and uh, decarbonizing or becoming rich by decarbonizing, mm -hmm. I, I think it's said that no other country has done that before. Mm -hmm. So how big do you think is a challenge for India? And I also bring, want to bring in the role of um, uh, multilateral development banks here because I think uh, the stock of they expanding their portfolio. In, and so I think how will the, what new role do you see the bank play in the, in, uh, in, in the scenario that is emerging and how do you draw in the private sector into that because the, wow. so that's a, that's a very long question but yes. I think the, the, the These are three very long questions yeah, in one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, yes. broadly I think yes. how do you, I mean uh, the crux yeah. is how do you yeah. decarbonize yeah. Yeah. and how do you get support? So, so let me acknowledge the concerns uh, that if you're going to grow faster uh, it's going to be it's going to be difficult to grow faster, richer, and decarbonize at the same time. Yeah. So, I, you know, I don't want to be dismissive of, of people who raise that concern. But, but I think it's a concern that is based on fear rather than uh, based on a rational way of looking at things. I'd like to bring in another economist, Schumpeter. Yeah. You know, he... He actually, no country has done what we need to do in the future, yeah. but countries have done things in the past that show us that what we want to do in the future is totally possible. Yeah. In the past, countries have grown by destroying the existing, the right. existing economy. Yeah. And what, that's what Schumpeter called creative destruction. Absolutely. You know, sometimes you have to destroy what, is, what you have, even though what you have is feeding you, yeah. You have to destroy it in order to, create, in order to create something better that can feed you better and also feed your children sure. in the process. So, you know, we don't need to worry about letting go of what may be good today but not good for tomorrow so we can create something that is good today and that's also good for tomorrow. We've seen countries move from agriculture into industry, into, into manufacturing in the past. Maybe there were fears of job being destroyed, you know, in agriculture, in the rural area. You know, and Europe kind of moved very smoothly from agriculture, extensive agriculture, to industry and grew. And of course, you know, we don't want those type of industries yeah. today, but we shouldn't worry about moving from those industries to newer ones. India has shown that you can actually grow by investing in digital IT, which, pro which are less polluting yeah. than the alternatives, and this creates growth rate. I mean, any country sitting anywhere else in the world looking at India will say, wow, this is a country that is showing us that you can actually grow and become bigger by polluting less. Yeah. That's exactly what India is doing. So I don't see why there is a fear of doing more of that. So just do more of that. Now, if you're going to have manufacturing become 25% of the economy, that will require some investment in some sectors that are perhaps more polluting than, uh, than writing a computer program, right? You may need more steel uh, to, for manufacturing. These are hard to abate sectors, you know, but, but those can also be supported by new uh, sources of energies, such as 
green hydrogen, which India is investing in, and India has a national mission for green hydrogen. So if those plants that the government has in place work, you can actually achieve 8% by reducing uh, carbon footprint in India. I mean, in other countries, one has to look at it. But in India, it's tot that's the path that we see uh, if, we are, if we are prepared to, to embrace it. Yeah. But, you know, if you don't embrace it and you say, okay, my own, I don't believe in my own path, then, then, you know, there is a risk of reversal. Yeah. That path is clear. And, and why it is also good to have that path is that that path will position India as a powerful exporters because tomorrow we know the CBAM. You know, the CBAM uh, is a mechanism that the EU has put in place to yeah. say they're not going to import things that have, that have a, a high carbon footprint. So countries that have low carbon footprint, if they invest in alternative uh, like green hydrogen, like renewable, uh, they will be able to export to the world more easily than countries that are not making the switch now. So it would be good. It's possible for us to grow. Uh, higher by uh, emitting less CO2 uh, and other greenhouse gases. It is good for the domestic economy, it's good for export. And yeah. now you, uh, there are two, two other parts of your question which I can touch on very briefly. The role of MDBs. Yeah. MDBs have a very important role because this transition that we're talking about is a global public good. Because if India were to be able to do it, it's good not just for India, but it's good for the world. And because it's a global public good, uh, our global system understands that the weight of creating that global public good should not be borne by a single country, it should, be, should be shared. Yeah. It's a shared responsibility. So our role as Multilateral Development Bank is to do just that by sourcing capital where it is uh, available to bring it to invest in global public good where the return is higher for the individual countries as well as for the world. So we see our role as expanding. Uh, you may have seen uh, that in the, G20, in the G20 under India's presidency, there was an independent expert group that uh, produced um, a very powerful report under the chairmanship of N.K. Singh and Larry Summers. Uh, and they want, us to, they want us to triple our mandate, to triple our size, to triple our partnership, to triple everything. And, and, and because they recognize that if we were to do that, it would be good for the world. So we are embarked on that. Internally at the World Bank, we have what we call the evolution roadmap, which focuses on the World Bank and says pretty much the same thing. We have to position, we position our mission to eliminating poverty on a livable planet, meaning wherever we are operating, we shouldn't just think of the environment, we, have, we should think of the planet. If we work in India, we should also think of the planet, as well as eliminating poverty in India, of course. And we, we have mechanism also to make ourselves more efficient, to mobilize more resources, including from the private sector, which is the second, this last part of your question, so working with the private sector uh, has now become uh, almost uh, imp you know, uh, unavoidable because government resources are, you know, we s we've seen in India, government has done a lot to invest, but government wants to reduce deficit going forward. So there is an upper bound on how much government can grow its investment. Private sector needs to come in to, to invest more. And we see ourselves as part of this mechanism of bringing private sector into uh, the development mix by perhaps de-risking investment. Instead of investing directly in asset, we can invest in risk or in reducing risk so the private sector can, can come in and invest. Um, and that is where, where we need to go because the resource needs are huge and government, MDBs, together will still be insufficient. So we need to bring in the private sector. I'm happy to elaborate on it, but let me pause here for now. No, no, I, I think that that's a great point. I mean, I wanted to end on, end on a happy note. I think mm. we, the progress that India has made in digital infrastructure mm. is much faster and yeah. much quicker yeah. than it can make in physical infrastructure. Absolutely. And I think uh, that's also, I think uh, we haven't seen in the past countries developing both of them simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So I think there would be probably some synergies which will, which will, so it will be more than the sum of the parts, physical and digital together. So how does this uh, uh, not only make growth higher because it will impact the, you referring to growth accounting, the mm -hmm. technology part, it will mm -hmm. impact that part, yes. but it will also try make it more inclusive. I mean. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, yes. absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that, and, and, and I feel bad because I should have been mentioned that we claim at the World Bank to think about inclusivity, and I didn't mention. But thanks for that. Digital infrastructure has been a very powerful source of inclusion in India. You know, it, it's, 
the numbers are, are huge. In the, during COVID, um, uh, DPI through ADA uh, allowed the government to reach people very quickly with uh, support for people who needed it. I think the government reached like 900 million people, yeah. you know, in a very short period of time. 900 million people is like more than the population of the whole of EU. It, it's, it's, it's huge. And you can do that only with technology. You can't do that if you have extension workers going from door to door to give uh, cash to people. Yeah. Right? And in doing that, the government reduced also leakages and waste. Um, so that's just one thing. And then what is happening now, as we, what we see, and uh, you know, I'm speaking to the convert because everybody in this room knows it more than I do, but the, the, the India stack with you know, combination of ADAR, with UPI, with, uh, uh, you know, the, can't even remember all the part, uh, with DigiLocker, uh, uh, you know, this combination is allowing informal sector workers to have access to credit in a way that you would not have imagined before. So somebody selling fruits can actually show that they have a track record of sales because their sales are recorded every day and they can have access to Lonai. So how it was used there, you know, live in, uh, in, in, in Amul, in Gujarat, where a farmer got credit you know, in 15 minutes. Yeah. So, so this is inclusion because these people will not have access to credit before. 77% um, of women who have um, uh, you know, access to that technology have, you know, they have opened a bank account. This is inclusion. They have a bank account now. So this, in, the, uh, this technology is, 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 is helping inclusion, but physical infrastructure needs to do its part also in, 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 in creating more inclusion. Uh, the physical infrastructure, for example, is needed to bring more women into the labor force, to include more women in the labor force. Women need to have easy way of going to work in a safe way, right? So if the roads are not there, if the, the, the transport system is not safe, they won't. You know, on the workplace, you also need physical infrastructure such as crash for children, for women to keep their children safe whilst they're working. Um, so there is a need for physical infrastructure to also play its role in, in pushing the inclusion agenda. And we care a lot about uh, inclusion of women in the labor force because it brings us back to growth. Uh, you know, earlier I said you can, if you, you can grow at 6.3% with 50% of your labor force, but you cannot grow at 8% yeah. without the other. So you need to bring in the women also into the labor force through this kind of physical infrastructure and other reforms so that growth can uh, reach 8% more easily. No, no, that's acknowledged. And I think the little bit of good news is that the latest data that was received, uh, released, I think, two, three days back shows that women's labor force participation has gone up. Good. A bit, I mean. That's not, good. Yeah. No, that's good. It's, it, trend matters. I mean, yeah. you know, of course, you cannot reach 50% overnight. So... And, and what you're mentioning is very, very good news because in the past, I think, 10 years or so, female labor force participation had gone down. Yeah. So, so it's good that this trend is reversing yeah. now, and, and that's very good news because I think from here on, it will, it will continue going up. So this was a really fascinating conversation, and I would like to thank you again for thank your you. time. Okay. And, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I wish we had more time. Yeah, but, uh, no, no, I think this can continue to go on. Uh, so I think, yeah. Okay. Then Thank you. I would request both of you to please continue being on the stage for a minute, please. Uh, I'd firstly like to thank both of you for highlighting the challenges towards creating sustainable infrastructure and overcoming the same. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you are aware, Crystal is a fervent champion of sustainability and social causes in India. In line with the commitment, Crystal has contributed to planting trees on behalf of our speakers today as a token of appreciation towards them. Uh, and uh, the certificate presented by DK to Dr. Kwame is essentially a certificate on the tree plantation. Thank you so much, Dr. Kwame, for your inputs, and thank you, DK, for hosting the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I believe uh, everybody is intrigued and there's a good context set up for the day. We would be moving on to the next part of our session where we'll be having a presentation on the Crystal theme. So beginning with that, firstly, I'd like to highlight that Crystal has pioneered in developing Crystal Infra Invex, India's first investability 
index that tracks, measures, and assesses the development, maturity, and investment attractiveness of different infrastructure sectors since 2017. I'm sure you'd be very interested in knowing how different sectors have fared this year vis-a-vis -vis the past. So I would request Jagan Narayan Padmabhan, Global Head and Senior Director, Transport, Logistics and Mobility, Crystal Consulting, to showcase Crystal's take on overall infrastructure and green financing, and take us through the findings of the latest Crystal Infra Invex 2023. Uh, sorry for the delay, there's a bit of a security check for the arrival of the minister. We'll just take two minutes for the same and then I'll hand over the stage to Jagan, please. Transport, Logistics and Mobility, Crystal Consulting to showcase Crystal's take on overall infrastructure and green financing and take us through the findings of Crystal's pioneered Infra Invex 2023. Over to you, Jagan. Thank you. Thank you, Guranshal. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute privilege to make the presentation on the theme, Building and Financing Sustainable Infrastructure, and also to present on Crystal's Infrastructure Investability Index. India's economy yeah, is set to double in the next seven years, reaching 6.3 trillion rupees. The investments in infrastructure sector is expected to grow at a faster pace. The next years, that is from 2024 to 2030, we expect the total infrastructure investments need to exceed close to 142.9 trillion rupees. The core infrastructure share in this is expected to contribute 67%, that is roads, railways, ports, airports, and urban infrastructure. The green infra investments is expected to have an exponential growth and we expect a five-fold increase predominantly focused on energy, power, and surface transport. Green investments in power and surface transport to witness an unprecedented surge. Power sector, broadly classified as non-fossil fuel segment, will have a 400% jump. Investments in grid and efficiency improvements will have a faster growth. We expect green hydrogen to attract a total investment of close to 1.5 trillion rupees. In total, we expect the investments to increase from the current 6.6 .6 trillion to touch 30.3 trillion rupees. Moving to the surface transport, the transition is going to be even more pronounced. More than 60% of the investments is going to come for setting up infrastructure, that is battery manufacturing, charging infrastructure, and the rest going in optimization and setting up of auto value chain. The total investments envisaged being is 6.3 trillion rupees. Moving on to the financing of this, we expect debt financing to dominate the total need. Banks, NBFCs, bonds, and external commercial borrowing is expected to contribute close to 75% of the need, and the rest being done through equity, and asset monetization and FDI. So equity will be contributing about 14%, asset monetization and the FDI will attract 5% each. The NIP, which was launched by the government in 2019, envisaged a total investment of 111 lakh crore. This was later enhanced to 147 lakh crore. The current implementation stands at 38% and we expect this to reach to 70% by year 2025. Heavy lifting has been done by the government in the core infra segments, that is with roads, railways, and urban infrastructure. Power and industrial sectors have attracted private capital and spending at close to 50%. Moving on to where these green investments are going to be made, we see six technologies which will attract most of this investment. Bioenergy, green hydrogen, capture carb sorry, carbon capture utilization and storage, electric vehicles, 
offshore wind and photovoltaics are the key areas where this money is going to be spent. Green hydrogen alone is expected to garner 1.5 lakh crore and potential for bioenergy being pegged at 42 gigawatts. Investments in electric vehicle related infrastructure to top 5.5 to 6 trillion rupees. So is everything hunky-dory? Not really. There are challenges and there are interventions that needs to come across. Among the challenges that is cited is the, it's a very capital intensive nature and long gestation period for green investments and hence the need for long term funding requirements with potential risk for financial institutions emanating from the new technologies. It's an underpenetrated domestic bond market and hence that also needs to be kept in mind with respect to the total infrastructure investment need. Higher global interest rates could hamper fundraising from the international bond market and ECBs in the short term. Also, five times growth in six years requires technological evolution and commercialization at breakneck speed. We would need all institutional pillars to fire on all cylinders. So what are the interventions that are needed? Financial institutions to overhaul and revitalize risk assessments and mitigation mechanism, as I talked before. Because some of these technologies are really not completely proven and they don't have a track record and hence the need for banks and institutions to take on this risk capital is important. There's a need for partnerships between the banks, F DFIs, um, non-banking financing companies, all co to come together to have a uniform standards in loan disbursements. The need for tax incentives for investment in green bonds, Mandatory disclosure by financial institutions and corporates to have increased transparency. The most important one is to build capacity across the value chain, be it the developers, the funding agencies, the research institutions, everyone in total. So moving on to our next section, that is the Infrastructure Investability Index. The Crystal Infra Index tracks and assesses developments, maturity, and investment attractiveness of 12 infrastructure sectors. This year, we have three new sectors joining the index, that is oil and gas, mining, and the EV ecosystem. Basically, there are four pillars which aids in scoring of each of the sector, that is policy direction, institutional strength, financial and environmental sustainability, and implementation ease being the broad themes for measurement. We do a scoring from 1 to 100, with 100 indicating the matureness of the sector. So as we can see from this, the broad ranking is, is on, on given as part in the left. We have about 60% weightage going for institutional strength and financial and environmental sustainability contributes to about 60% of this. In this year, we have also added the environmental aspect which is needed for tracking of this. And you can see on the scoring part of it, we have the renewable energy has been driving investment attractiveness for the power sector and has seen a 20% increase over our 2019 base year and roads and highways continues to outshine other segments. To call out some of the drivers and drags which are which is influencing this particular index for the roads the drivers are strong project pipeline high government investment for power transmission is the long term planning the pgci execution capability for the renewable energy is the government targets pli focus and falling lcoe with technology on the drags which is on the bottom end part of it the conventional generation have a lack of financing with increasing decarbonization focus. Power distribution has a legacy of loss burden of the discoms and missed operational targets. And the urban infra has a significant uptick, but still, it's still early, early days in the climate change financing aspect, and it's seen as a drag for us. More details of this is available in the Crystal Infrastructure Yearbook, which will, we will be releasing very shortly, and which will be made available to you as well. So this brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you all for such a patient hearing. Back to you, Guranshan.
thank you jagan uh, we are expecting the arrival of the minister till that point of time uh, we will have some uh, questions from the audience on the uh, presentation as made by jagan and then we'll be proceeding towards our uh, infrastructure yearbook launch jagan any questions from the audience uh, on the uh, presentation and crystal's view on the overall infrastructure outlook please If, uh, if audience has any que we didn't get time to have que uh, question answer session with Dr. Kwame. So if uh, anybody has questions for Dr. Kwame, we'll be requesting him to also, uh, you know, take those for us and uh, take it up for us, please. Any questions uh, till the time we expect the arrival of the minister, he'll be in, in with us in any minute now. Yes, please. Uh, can we have the mic? Yeah. Sir, I'd request you to please state your name and then uh, tell us for whom you would like to take the question, please. Yeah, hi. This is Rupesh Mishra. I am representing Bharti Airtel, the telecom company. So, uh, to Dr. Kwame, I have a question. I mean, I'm first of all thankful like for admitting that faster, richer cannot happen together with the decarbonization. But I would like to, you know, hear thought with all these new initiatives of green infra, green energy, solar, EV. Why, why can't, why can't, you know, both the things move together? I mean, what's the main challenge? And at what time do we see emerging economies being able to decarbonize as well as go on a sustainable path of growth? Thank you very much for this question. It actually gives me a chance to clarify what I said. Um, I don't believe that faster, greener growth cannot happen together. I don't think growth and decarbonization cannot happen together. I think the two can happen together. I just uh, said that I needed to acknowledge people who have concerns about that trade-off, uh, as it may be called. But, but I'm on the side of people who believe there is synergy, actually, between fast growth and decarbonization because of the world in which we live today, because of what demand for goods is going to tell us. You know, in the future, people are not going to buy goods that have a high carbon footprint. So if you don't decarbonize, but you want to grow faster, you will be producing for a market that does not exist. If um, you don't want to decarbonize now and you want to keep old assets uh, to power your growth, those assets are going to be stranded. They're going to become stranded assets, so you will put you know, good money after bad. Uh, and as I said, Schumpeter told us that you need to actually abandon these things in order to move to better sources of growth. Uh, in the future. So I believe there is synergy. The more you invest in decarbonization, the more you increase your chances of growing faster in the future. Having said that, you know, maybe there will be a one or two year transition where the investment you make in greener growth will be money that you'll not be able to consume. And that may subtract a little bit from growth because the investment will produce returns only maybe three years down the road. In the meantime, that investment is not you know, really powering growth as much, but it, it definitely increases your growth, your potential growth, and it increases your actual growth in the future. And it makes your actual growth higher and healthier because it puts less pressure on your system. So we can have a long conversation about that, but just to clarify that I believe in synergy rather than trade-off. Now, uh, is this good for developing countries? Yes, absolutely, because it means developing countries can actually, developing and emerging market economies can actually decide to invest in new technologies and leapfrog uh, advanced economies that are locked into old technologies, which, for which they need to divest and invest in new, in, a new. Whilst if countries don't have, if you don't have old traditional power plants, it's easier to build renewable energy plants and green hydrogen than if you had old one. So I think we are on the same page. Thanks. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Kwame. Any other questions? We'll be taking a few more questions on the Crystal's view as well on the infrastructure outlook. Uh, Jagan can take that up for you. We are expecting minister's arrival any minute now. So any questions on that side, we'll be happy to take those as well. Hi, uh, hi, I'm Radhika. My question is for Dr. Kwame, if that's OK. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question is to do with the differentiation between climate finance and development finance. Uh, for the development of infrastructure, we often see uh, that there can be limitations to just the wording climate finance. So my question is, how do we use these words interchangeably and can climate finance be broadened to be called development finance so that infrastructure projects can also benefit because we do need a lot of infrastructure support to support green growth. Thank you. Thank you for this question. I think it goes back to the earlier question, which is that decarbonization, climate, and development are really the same thing. They're synergistic. So your question fundamentally is telling us, you know, any finance now is has to be climate finance. Any development finance has to be climate. There is, and, and I fully agree with you. I don't think we see space for investing for the, in development in a way that is not consistent with the climate change agenda because of all the things that we talked about earlier. This being said, we're still in a transition phase. We're in a learning uh, path where we have, not all uh, economies have agreed on the taxonomy of what is climate finance and what is green finance. And not all economies have put together regulations to ensure that what is green is actually green uh, and, what, and to ensure that the taxonomy is respected. Not all countries have put in place a mechanism to ensure that when investments are made, actually, you know, when, when the infrastructure is built, it's run in a way that is consistent with the green agenda. So because of the lack of taxonomy, lack of regulation, and fear of greenwashing, uh, there is a need to kind of have some tight control over what we call climate finance, but over time, I see a world where all financing will have to be uh, consistent with climate finance. But in the meantime, I think we need to develop the taxonomies and, uh, and have regulations in place to, 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 uh, to, to, to manage the climate finance and maybe use that to uh, reduce the cost of climate finance so that they have a sort of leg up over other t traditional financing so you know, we can accelerate the transition. I hope it answered the question. If it didn't, please let me know, and I'll be happy to clarify. Um, thank you, Dr. Kwame. I believe you have um, well really answered the question. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my utmost privilege to announce that our chief guest, Sri Nitin Gadkariji, Minister of Road, Transport, and Highways, Government of India, has graced us with his presence. I would request a good round of applause for him, please. Thank you, everybody. We'll be, take, uh, we'll be taking the questions with Dr. Kwame after this particular session, but we'll move on to the next part of the uh, proceedings. Uh, following the Jagan's presentation on Crystal overall theme and infra -invex, I would like to proceed towards the launch of the latest edition of Crystal Infrastructure Yearbook, elaborating in detail trends, insights, and investment needs in infrastructure sector along with Crystal infra -invex. Team, can we have the AV, please? India is engaged in an unprecedented population scale infrastructure build out. Arguably, the largest such continuous and ongoing spending in memory to structurally lift its potential growth rate and offer a better life to its 140 crore people. There is a humongous more of spending to come. The Crystal Infrastructure Yearbook captures all the trends and projections around India's infrastructure investment needs in a comprehensive compendium. The yearbook offers granular perspectives on various sub-segments including power, transport and urban sectors. It contains the Crystal Infra Invex, 
a unique investability index tracking investment attractiveness across the sub-sectors. The theme this year is overarchingly green. So the yearbook is titled Building and Financing Sustainable Infrastructure. We are proud to present the Crystal Infrastructure Yearbook 2023. Now, I would like to invite our Honorable Minister Shri Nitin Gadkari ji, our MD and CEO Amish Mehta, Dr. Kwame, Mr. Ashish Vora, President Chrysal MINA, and Mr. Dharmkirti Joshi, and Mr. Suresh Krishnamurti, Business Head Research and Consulting, on the stage for unveiling the physical copy of the Infra Yearbook. Imbibing with the theme of sustainability, this year's Chrysal Infra Yearbook has been printed on a recycled paper. May we have the printed copies of the yearbook on the stage, please? Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to have Mr. Gadkari amongst us. He has been instrumental in revolutionizing the transport and logistics sector in India. Under his leadership, the road network development per day has reached an all-time high. His efforts towards connecting the nation and bringing down logistics costs are instrumental in realizing India's vision under Azadika Amrit Mahautsav. He is championing the cause of developing smart and sustainable road infrastructure, mobility and logistics ecosystem. Sir, we would be very keen to hear from you on India's vision towards sustainable infrastructure. So I would request you to be kindly come on the stage and please make your address for the audience. Thank you, sir. Requesting to be on the stage, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Mr. Gadkari, please. Amish Mehta, MD Krisil, Ashish Ora, President Krisil, Sri Suresh Krishnamurti, Business Head Krisil, Dr. Komi, Country Director India, World Bank, all respectable dignitaries and dear friends. The infrastructure development is most important agenda for the government. The dream of our Prime Minister to make Indian economy of $5 trillion and to make India Atma Nirbhar Bharat, we need more export, more industry, and even in development in agriculture, rural sector. But the most important thing that when we need to develop agriculture and industry, we should have good infrastructure, water, power, transport, and communication. Without that, we cannot get industry. Without industry, we cannot create employment potential. And without employment potential, we cannot achieve the growth and eradication of poverty. 
and that is the most important reason is we need to develop world class infrastructure in the country the most important thing is presently in our country the logistic cost is 14 to 16% and as compared with china it is 8 to 10% and european countries and us it is 12% our mission is to make this logistic cost less than 10% in the single single digit to 9% after the end of 24 end we are making lot of green express highways we are using different alternative fuels and for that reason the innovation and research is very important anywhere where we are making research we need to identify the needs need based research region based research the rural agriculture and tribal economy what type of raw materials available on the basis of we need to develop our research the innovation entrepreneurship science technology research skill and successful practices we name it as knowledge and conversion of knowledge into wealth is the future for that reason this is the time that first important challenge with the people like krishi that how we are going to reduce the cost of construction and improve the quality of construction how we can develop different type of materials which can be alternatives i just giving you the example in ur2 the ring road of delhi starting from that peripheral point road in delhi chandigarh road where we have already used 25 lakh ton of municipal garbage into road construction then at the same time in amdavad dolero expressway we used 30 lakh ton of municipal garbage of amdavad in that road now we have successfully implemented the crash barrier of bamboo at the same time now we are uh, just we i decided to call a meeting of oil companies and adding the rubber tire use rubber tire is a big problem you you know you can understand the importance of uh, recycling industry it is a big industry one is waste to wealth and that waste we can convert into a valuable thing where we can contribute for the development of our nation we have scrapping policy now just like tire from tire the we get rubber powder and we can add that rubber powder into bitumen up to 15% and we can sell rubberized bitumen now you just take understand the economics presently the need of the country is 80 lakh ton of bitumen out of which indian refineries capacity is 50 lakh ton of bitumen and 30 lakh ton of import so now if we add 15% this rubber powder the rate is 30 rupees per kg and bitumen rate is 50 55 so you can understand it's economically also advantage and by which we can make it that we can reduce the cost of bitumen at the same time improve the quality of bitumen now the central research road organization and the dehradun institute both have now successfully formulate the their experiment uh, that is conversion of rice straw to bitumen now pearl is a big problem and the delhi people are facing the problem of pollution now in panipat the indian oil has already started the project i was keenly interested in making follow up of this project for many years thanks to mr vaidya from indian oil chairman and is take the initiative and now in that project they are making 1 lakh liter of bioethanol from rice straw and 150 ton of bio bitumen and now they are in the process of making a bio aviation fuel so now it is to be at international level there is a resolution on the highest level to add 10% of bio aviation fuel in petroleum aviation fuel so that is going to reduce the pollution but at the same time it is going to be helpful for the farmer so today from biomass we can make bio bitumen and there is a huge potential for that it can reduce our import it can reduce the cost of the bitumen the most important thing which is very important in the country we have got lot of waste materials available like steel slag mr doshi who is from india but now in australia 
he has successfully implemented air strip making air strip in australia with the steel slag the steel slag is best material available in the steel industry and we can use that material for road construction already we have successfully used this material in jamshedpur in jharkhand and now raigarh also we are using that so that can be a great thing great contribution for ecology and environment at the same time we can reduce the cost i don't have very good opinion about steel industry and cement industry whenever they get the chance they make the cartel and increase the rate the only thing is important that we should make alternative materials now we are allowing glass fiber steel the cost is 20 to 30% is less and we need to encourage them at the same time there are lot of alternative materials where we are using 35% of flash into the cement even we can make lot of experiment by soil stabilization and using of flash in the road construction the most important thing is it's very important to the country like india with in malaysia they have a good technology that is reinforcement concrete in the metro and the, uh, in the flyover the distance between the two pier is maximum 50 meter 30 meter no one is taking 50 meter also so in the malaysia the purvan technology we now we have accepted that and we are using it that is the distance between the two pier we can go up to 120 meter so it reduce the cost by 30% in the flyover even in the metro so the upper side beam is precasted and that is in with the steel fiber now i am trying that in the building construction and road construction we need this is the time for the country that we can make mandatory precast the precast by which we can reduce the cost we can make the common designs and at the same time we will protect the ecology and environment because any construction the site create lot of problem now the problem is that what i feel this is the time where we are facing the problem and where your role is important the preparation of dpr is a big problem for nhi on in the everywhere the principle is we are selecting the lowest quoted people and no one is coming to take 100% payment from the government such a worst class uh, third class people who are now in engage in this making of dpr there is no perfect dpr anywhere in any project and actually at the time of the dpr neither they are re- ready to accept the new technology new innovation new research and even the standard of dpr is so low that everywhere there additional scope of work <coughs> we have to change lot of thing practical level lot of problem we are facing so rating of dpr companies and rating of contractor is a big challenge where i am putting this challenge with krishi you make an odd level we can make the policy we will give them the priority and without that it is very difficult to implement quality infrastructure in the country now the problem is that once upon a time there was nhi we have some 50 contractors i feel that this is not correct i liberalized the technical and financial norms by which today we have 600 contractors the problem is that gade ghode barabar ban gaye aur abhi aur 30 40% below quote kar rahe somewhere we need to maintain the equilibrium between the quality and the cost and that is also a big challenge we are developing good infrastructure green highways tunnels roads and at the same time i don't will elaborate many thing about it but it is to be the end of this year up to december delhi to dehradun will be 2 hours delhi to hridwar will be 1 and a half hour delhi to amritsar 4 hours delhi to katra 6 hours delhi to srinagar 8 hours now bangalore to chennai up to end of the 2 2 hours bangalore to mysore 1 uh, hour already it is completed then we are making a road from surat to nasik nasik to ahmednagar ahmednagar to solapur green highway and by which from solapur it go to karnool and karnool to hyderabad bangalore bangalore chennai chennai kanyakumari trivandrum cochin 
all cities of Hyderabad. So we are going to reduce the distance between Delhi to Chennai by 320 km. Now from Delhi to Chennai, you don't need to go to Mumbai and Pune, Kolhapur and Solapur. I am also happy that I am giving you the good example. In our school days, we are always talking about Kashmir to Kanyakumari. Now the first time we are starting making road in Manali. Manali to Rotang Pass, it takes three and a half hours. But already we have constructed a tunnel, tunnel by which it will be, we will cross with eight minutes. That from Rotang Pass to by Atal Tunnel coming to Ladakh layer, we are making five tunnels and roads. And coming to Ladakh layer to Srinagar on the road in Kargil, we have 70% of work is completed. This is the biggest tunnel in Asia, Jojila Pass. It's a state of art project. From Jojila, just 20 km, 10 kilometers after that, Jedmore Tunnel coming to Srinagar. Then Srinagar to Jammu, we have already in the process of making up 18 tunnels, out of which 14 tunnels, 15 tunnels are already completed. And three will be completed before end of December. And then we will come to Katra. Before Katra, there is Katra Delhi Express Highway coming to Amrutsar, Amrutsar to Delhi. And Delhi directly to Vaidwarka Express where they will go to Delhi Mumbai Express Highway <coughs> up to the Surat. And Surat again going to Solapur. <coughs> and after Solapur and this Karnul, they can go to Kanyakumari, to Chennai. So this is Kashmir to Kanyakumari. So we'll reduce the cost. And this is to be 320 kilometer reduction. Area. We are making a lot of express highway, green express highway. You know all the things. I don't elaborate that. But the most important thing is regarding reducing the logistic cost. We have to seriously think on the alternative fuel and biofuel. Now in G20, we have biofuel allies. Now you just understand, we have the import of fossil fuel of 16 lakh crores. And within two, three years, it will go up to 25 lakh crores. Just you can understand what is the big challenge for our economy. And at the same time, there will be more pollution. So our policy is import substitute cost effective pollution free and indigenous. I am coming just with the car. That is the first car in the world from Toyota with uh, U U Euro 6 emission norms. It is on 100% bioethanol. The car is, uh, what is the name of the car then? High Cross, Innova. And uh, the car is running 60% on uh, electricity. They are generating electricity and using 40% ethanol. The car is also running on petrol also. So the cost of per kilometer is coming 1 rupees 50 paisa per kilometer like electricity. So even uh, I feel that this is going to do no pollution and this is going to helpful for the farmer. Now the two wheelers from Bajaj, TBS and Hero also are there. Then three wheeler is also there on flex engine. Now we are planning of starting ethanol pump in the country and by which ethanol will be the alternative fuel for the petrol. It will reduce pollution, it will reduce import, and it is going to helpful for the agriculture and rural India. We are making ethanol from rice, uh, from uh, sugarcane juice, from molasses, B molasses, C molasses, from broken rice, corn. Then we are making ethanol from pearly rice straw, and uh, it is the future that ethanol economy even we can use in buses also, and there is a huge potential for bioethanol. Then we are working on methanol. Methanol is from coal. I already started the pilot project, which is completed in Bangalore, by using 15% methanol in diesel, adding in diesel. Successfully, it is implemented. The rate of the methanol is 25 rupees per liter. Now, all heavy machinery, the subject which is related with you, the Man, Hall, many big Ashok Leyland, they are making machinery and they are now converting their machine into hydrogen, methanol and bio LNG and bio CNG, even LNG or CNG. That is going to reduce the cost. So my suggestion is the alternative fuel economy, either it is biofuel or alternative fuel, is going to reduce the construction cost. Now diesel is hazardous and the cost is very high. 
so we are insisting that how we can get the machinery construction equipment on hydrogen now ic engine from tata and leland they have successfully implemented the experiment that we can use hydrogen hydrogen is the futuristic fuel the futuristic vision futuristic development futuristic technology is very important for the country and the green hydrogen is most important the hydrogen from the coal is black hydrogen hydrogen from the petroleum is brown hydrogen but hydrogen from water and hydrogen from biomass is the green hydrogen the by electrolyzer process the hydrogen cost where we have to use 50 unit of power that's the cost of the hydrogen is 3 to more than 3 dollar per kg but dr yadav from mumbai he just give me the presentation and uh, indian chemical institute in bangalore by biodigester they are making green hydrogen and dr yadav is very confident he has already got the uh, patent that we can reduce the cost of hydrogen green hydrogen less than 1 dollar i have got the car running on hydrogen the name of the car is mirai in japani the mirai word it means that future and we can use hydrogen in chemical industry steel industry transport railway engine and even in the aviation and everywhere presently we are importing fuel we are importing energy but with hydrogen we will become the country as uh, the exporter of the energy so that is the most important thing for the country by adding this 25 lakh crores we can save and we can convert our transport on electric methanol ethanol biodiesel lng cng bio lng bio cng green hydrogen it is going to helpful for the rural agriculture economy the people like you who understand better economics in our gdp growth the agriculture contribution is coming to only 12% and the population belongs to agriculture rural india is 65% the manufacturing sector contributes 22 to 24% and service sector 52 to 54% now this is the time that without making creating employment potential in agriculture without having good technology in rural agriculture tribal india we need to develop the technology on jal zameen jangal and janwar on the basis of that we can create more jobs more growth and increase the growth from 12% to 22% and which is going to solve our all urban problem in the country the migration from rural to to the urban area what is the reason is the per capita income gdp growth employment potential good school good colleges good uh, sustainable life is there in the rural area they don't need to come to this urban city so this is the time that we should create employment potential development growth in agriculture india we have 120 infra uh, aspirant districts and 500 blocks which are socially economically educationally bad at the same time the people are doing excellent jobs in the research now we have got lot of technology conversion of carbon dioxide to ethanol carbon dioxide to methanol and adding value addition in carbon dioxide it will be great thing for the country we will reduce the pollution somewhere what the important thing is the people like you who know that the proven technology economic viability availability of raw material and marketability of the finished product so on the basis of that my request to, you, to all of you that you should give priority for development of rural and agriculture india we need to take more good technology good successful practices in the world we need to find out the alternative for our imports and to giving solution in rural india and that is exactly the need of the country because the imbalance economy is not going to help for the country we make we want to make india the indian economy at the third largest economy in the world that is the dream of the prime minister this is a difficult job but it's not impossible i can just tell you the example of atovel industry where my minister is related with that when i taken charge as the minister the size of the industry was 7.5 lakh crore our number was 7 in the world as a automobile manufacturing industry but now our number is third just 3 month before we just surpassed japan now the first number is usa second is uh, china 
and third is India, and fourth is Japan. And the size of the industry is 12.5 lakh crore. And this is the industry which is giving maximum GST to the central and state government, maximum revenue to the state and central government. This is the industry which up till now creates 4 crore 50 lakh jobs. To creating jobs is very important. The industrial people, they are not wealth creator, they are employment creator. Without creating employment, there is no meaning for any growth. We need to find out the policy by which how we are going to create more employment potential. We need industrial growth. We need industry, but the we involvement of maximum number of persons. To create more jobs is the most important thing for the country. And we are the country where we have got the highest young, talented engineering manpower in the country. The export potential is very huge. The whole world is now thinking to deal with India. In the world situation, you know better about what type of position is going on. And now the people want to enter in India to invest here. And in the same time, if we can create good infrastructure in the and reducing the logistic cost with the young talented engineering, engineering manpower and with the availability of raw materials, we can make the miracles. The cost of production is very less. Now in automobile sector, all the automobile plants, uh, every all of reputed plants in the world, now they are present in India. And now they want to export from India. So today, this is the great potential. By developing good infrastructure, we will achieve the goal of the mission of Prime Minister to make Indian economy of $5 trillion and making India the third largest economy in the world. I will request you, this is my agenda for you, that you should work on rating of DPR consultant and rating of contract. The financial audit is very important. The technology is very important. The performance audit is more important than financial thing and technical thing. Because without that, we cannot achieve our goal. So today I'm very much happy and giving my special wishes to Chrisil doing excellent job with uh, giving guidance for making qualitative infrastructure, eco-friendly infrastructure. And the line of the country and the government is import substitute cost effective pollution free and indigenous. I am confident that we will achieve the goal. We will make the Indian road equivalent to USA before end of 24. That is to be dream and mission for all of us. We are making good roads. And I feel that now we are also in logistic. We have a proposal of 2,50,000 crores. We are making logistic parks. We are, have the proposal of 260 proposals of ropeway, cable car, funicular railway. Now we are planning to make electric cable highway from Delhi to Jaipur. The trolley bus will be there, electric truck will be there. So the lot of new innovation, every time we are trying to accept that. And I feel that the huge potential for investment. Last point which I will tell you. We don't, we need investment from abroad. But I am giving a good successful example. I am quite insisting that we need to take the investment from the small people. In our invit bond in Mumbai Stock Exchange, when we started selling of the bond for invit model, the time period was fixed up for seven days. And the first day, in seven hours, our bond issue was subscribed seven times more. Seven times more. And now we are giving them return of 8.05% per year and giving interest monthly in their bank account. So the small people, the government servant, the constable, the compounder, the small people can invest in Invit model in NHI and we will give them 8.05% interest. You know the, what is the interest on fixed deposit in the bank. So the small poor people by investing in NHI, my dream, dream is to make more roads. We don't have any problem of investment. The people are every time coming to us that we are ready to invest with you. Our problem how to make the expenditure, how to increase the speed of construction, that is the problem. The all projects are economically viable. Internal rate of return is very good. No problem. But now not only in road construction, the people like you need to find out. Even in solid waste management, liquid waste management, we can make the investment of 5 lakh crore. You make the research and study of the project of Mathura. When I was water resource minister, I implemented the project, 80 MLT sludge of Mathura. Now the clean water from that, the Triveni Engineering is the company. 
we are making that project hybrid NUT, 40% from the government, 60% from the investor. And the clean water is purchased by Indian oil refinery in Mathura, giving 20 crore rupees per year. Previously, they were given 25 crore to Uttar Pradesh Sarkar. But now, they are getting water with 20 crore, saving of 5 crore with them. And now, this is a successfully project implemented in solid waste management, liquid waste management. So, we can make and transport in electric buses, electric trolley buses, ropeway, cable car. We can convert municipal waste, segregate the waste. Everywhere there is a public private investment is possible. Their good economy, economics is there. And that's the reason the people like you who have can find out where is the public private investment, where is economically viable, by which we can accelerate our economy, creating more jobs and develop our country as a third largest economy in the world and Atmanirbar Bharat. Once again, I'm giving thanks to all of you. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you, sir, for such a power-packed address and being at the forefront for ensuring that we can travel through our incredible India seamlessly. We all imbibe by India's vision of, the de of developing world-class infrastructure while keeping environment at forefront and managing the economies. I would now request our MD and CEO, Mr. Amish Mehta, to please felicitate our honorable guest with a certificate of tree plantation. Sir, please. Thank you, sir, for your time and uh, giving us your august presence. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nitin Gadkari, Honorable Minister, Road, Transport and Highways. Thank you, everybody. I would request everybody to please settle down. Thank you, Dr. Kwame, for being amongst us. We'll move in on to the next session. But before that, I would request all the delegates to please collect their copies of Crystal Infrastructure Yearbook 2023 from the registration desk during the breaks. We'll be jumping on to the next session immediately after this. While the setup is being done, let me give you a context on what is coming up next. As we have been already set up by the vision of Mr. Gadkari and the context which Dr. Kwame gave up in the beginning, we would like to jump into the first panel of the day, which shall be green capital financing. We'll be trying and understanding how private fronts are going to drive the sustainability transition. Our panel moderator shall be Mr. Pranam Master, Senior Practice Leader and Director, Energy and Sustainability. Pranav, can we have you on the stage, please, while I invite the panelists? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So now I'll go up and invite our stellar list of panelists for this particular panel. We'll start with Mr. Mohit Bhargav, ED, NTPC RE. I would request you, sir, to please come on the stage. Mr. Anil Rawal, MD and CEO, IntelliSmart. Sir, please. Mr. Akshay Hiranandani, CEO, Serenitika Renewables. Mm -hmm. 
and Mr. Satish Mandana, Senior MD and CIO, Eversource Capital. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for the, our panelists, please. Thank you, everybody. Pranav, over to you, please. Thank you, Garanchal. And uh, a very good morning to all of you. And a warm welcome to the fourth edition of Crystal's Infrastructure Conclave. Um, as we march towards a $5 trillion economy, uh, investments in infrastructure are expected to be a bedrock for growth. Uh, as per Crystal's recent estimates, uh, about 145 trillion uh, rupees of infrastructure investments are expected over fiscal 2024 to fiscal 2030. This is almost double as compared to the preceding period. Of these total investments, we also expect about 36 trillion rupees or about one fourth of the total investments to be directed towards green infrastructure. Now, one of the prerequisites of this large scale infrastructure build out is going to be the availability of capital at a reasonable cost. Um, potentially, one could uh, clearly see that public resources as well as the conventional channels of financing are expected to not completely suffice this large scale requirement. And hence, we will need to look at alternate uh, pools of capital as well as innovative financing structures to ensure there is adequate funding availability. Uh, green and sustainable finance instruments are emerging as one such option. Uh, potentially blended finance, uh, can, which is essentially commercial capital plus concessional capital, can also uh, crowd in private capital, particularly for uh, emerging uh, technologies and help transition from an energy perspective. Uh, possibly uh, bond markets, invits are not fully tapped. One can look at that also. And last but not the least, you know, uh, the carbon markets can also potentially play a role uh, in supporting the financing of energy transition. Uh, during the course of our panel discussion, uh, we will delve into some of these topics. We'll, uh, we'll try and discuss uh, potential opportunities, challenges, strategies, and policies that can help channel funds uh, and finance towards uh, funding our large uh, infrastructure requirements. Now, with this backdrop, uh, uh, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome all the panelists. Uh, we have a well-rounded panelist of infrastructure developers as well as financiers and look forward to this uh, engaging discussion with all. Uh, but before we get into this uh, panel discussion, I'd like to uh, engage with the audience and uh, I'd like to put up a poll question for, all, for the audience here. Um, uh, you can scan the QR codes that you see on, the, on your desk on the uh, uh, pamphlet. Uh, what I just wanted to get a perspective of is, you know, what are some of the levers that can help mainstream green financing? And I'd request to rank these in order of, uh, uh, of importance. So while the audience does that, I will jump uh, into the panel discussion and maybe somewhere in the middle of the panel, we can look at, uh, you know, what are some of these responses uh, according to our audience. Uh, so without much further ado, I will jump uh, into the uh, discussion. Uh, I'd like to start with Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Mandana. Uh, Mr. Mandana, now uh, India is faced with a unique challenge of, uh, of energy trilemma, uh, security, affordability, and sustainability. Uh, how can capital be directed so that there is a balance that is maintained, and particularly uh, green capital uh, in particular, uh, how can it help balance and address this complex issue of energy trilemma? Thanks, uh, and thanks for uh, having invited us uh, on this panel. Uh, obviously, 
the question raised and the solution uh, are actually embedded into the question itself. Today, as we transition our energy scenario from a fossil fuel-led energy to renewable energy, we have a solution which is commercially attractive uh, and viable. Uh, at the same time, uh, we should also re remember that one megawatt is more important than one megawatt. So if you are able to save one unit of energy, you are actually saving much higher amount of energy because there are transmission and other losses which happens from a generation perspective. So the emphasis on transitioning from a fossil fuel based energy sources to the renewable energy sources, uh, as well as an emphasis on making ourselves much more energy efficient in all of our ways and walks of life uh, will help. Now coming to the funding of these solutions, uh, Obviously, India remains a very attractive destination for the foreigners uh, to invest into the energy transition story of India. Uh, as we have seen, the amount of foreign capital which has come in through different forms, which includes uh, different energy-focused funds uh, of a significant sizes, uh, as well as the energy bond market for the, some of the large companies over here. But I'd like to draw your attention towards the fact where uh, gap exists and which can be easily filled. And that's the flow of or channelizing the domestic capital uh, to the green capital avenues. And the government of uh, India and RBI uh, has come out with a green bond, green deposits framework. Uh, and if each one of us start participating into that green deposit uh, movement, uh, we can create a huge pool of uh, capital for the green sectors as such. Uh, and the story which we have seen in mutual funds business where SIP is now virtually equaling the foreign inflows can get repeated uh, in relation to the green infrastructure itself. So that's one of the big things which we can happen. The second big thing which can happen going forward is the green bond market where it becomes uh, much more easier for the retail participant to really participate and Minister was giving an example of how it has been made enabled over there. So enabling a more aggressive green deposit structure and enabling a green bond market uh, in a much more vibrant and participative manner, combined with the fact that the, there's a huge market opportunity which exists for the foreign funds in this country can really help to transition that, what you talked about. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mandana. You bring out a very, uh, a very relevant uh, uh, aspect. What you're essentially saying is that uh, India is sitting on very large uh, uh, savings uh, and I think channelizing those uh, to green deposits uh, uh, will help uh, uh, mobilize uh, large uh, domestic savings as well and obviously uh, uh, regulatory uh, uh, policy and policy led changes uh, uh, such as what we're seeing on the green deposits of the framework can also help mobilize uh, larger capital towards uh, green projects. So thanks for that. Uh, continuing that thread on uh, sustainability, um, I'd like to turn to uh, Mr. Bhargava. Uh, Mr. Bhargava, uh, as we transition uh, and we see energy transition, we are likely to see uh, adoption of emerging technologies such as green hydrogen and its derivatives, uh, carbon capture, how are you seeing the uh, funding scenario as far as some of the emerging uh, energy transition linked technologies are concerned? Uh, uh, good morning and uh, thanks. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, I think part of this was uh, also covered in the speech given by Honorable Minister when he talked about a lot of new and emerging technologies like green hydrogen and uh, uh, carbon capture and utilization. And I think it was also in the earlier presentation I saw, I, mean, uh, I think by one of your colleagues who talked about uh, these new and emerging technologies. But one fundamental fact remains, you know, uh, funding I think is never an issue for a good project. So if the project is good, I don't think you guys see green or sustainable or any kind of color there. You all invest. And uh, that is borne out by the fact that today India is also investing in fossil fuel. 
I believe world is investing in fossil fuel. I mean, we are not the only guys doing it. Uh, Europe is doing it. Whatever be the upfront you know, optics, but otherwise everyone is investing wherever the money is. So, so as long as the project is good, the fundamentals are good, money will come. The challenge with the uh, alternative technologies is that many of these are still nascent stage, early stage, viability is still an issue, which is why if you look at green hydrogen, for example, I think uh, we are among the very few guys who are actually doing pilots there. We have put some money there. Otherwise, uh, the credit or the bank funding is still probably not coming through. Uh, similar is the case with carbon capture and utilization, another project we are doing uh, at NTPC. So many of these projects will actually take off once there is a clear financial viability which is established. Uh, I think the minister also mentioned about DPR, so rating the agencies who can actually give a good DPR, bankable DPR for you guys to start investing. So all of that somehow once again happily links back to you guys that you have to start the work on giving good rating to the good uh, agencies who can do good, uh, good DPS. But like on a fundamental basis, if you talk about NTPC, we don't have an issue in funding. I mean, we can always raise funds and invest money, which is why we are investing in the pilots. The minister talked about hydrogen buses. We are the guys who are investing in that. We are doing those hydrogen buses in Leh. And the uh, Honorable Minister was there in Chennai when the bus was launched. We already started doing a pilot on green hydrogen with uh, of blending green hydrogen to natural gas pipeline in Gujarat. We're working on a pilot for carbon capture and green hydrogen, combining them both to make green methanol. Again, a very clearly import substitution kind of fuel, which can actually make things move much faster in terms of reducing the cost of imports. But if you look at the renewable side per se, so there are so many technologies. We're talking today about floating solar. We are the guys who have actually done 260 megawatts of floating solar, and we are the only guys who have done that kind of scale in the country. Uh, there's also a lot of work being done on the storage side, because when you talk about sustainability on a long-term basis, so we can do as many solar and wind projects as we want, but ultimately if we want to start, I think Satish mentioned about reducing fossil fuel, that can happen only if we have a viable alternative in terms of reliable 24-7 green power, and that happens only with storage. So there is scope in storage. So funding for these projects will come, but in the meanwhile, we have to look at how we can keep moving forward. Transition is not a one-step journey. It will require all of us to take multiple steps to reach at a point where we want to be. So funding will follow. Sure, thanks. Uh, uh, I think heartening to hear all the all the initiatives taken on all the emerging technologies uh, from NTPC's uh, side. And I think clearly, um, uh, from an NTPC perspective, uh, I think a strong balance sheet uh, clearly uh, helps. But just to follow up there, uh, uh, say on again on these energy transition led technologies, what is the kind of response? Uh, say because everybody may not have these kind of balance sheets. So what is the say the response of say uh, MDBs on such technologies? Uh, is there a blended finance that can be uh, you know utilized, uh, uh, which is a combination of you know some concessions uh, and then commercial capital being blended along with that? Are you seeing uh, response adequately from DFIs, MDBs there? So incidentally, uh, Mr. Kwame is not here. But honestly, I haven't seen any uptake from the MDBs or any appetite from the MDBs because these guys actually want some umpteen number of guarantees. So I don't think they're quite keen to finance. Okay, so they might finance a DPR, which is a, maybe a small amount of money, they, yeah, technical assistant or whatever they call it. But in terms of actually investing in the projects, I don't see any of these MDBs coming forward. In fact, we are engaging with quite a few of them. and. Uh, I would say like any other lender, they're quite keen to back an established name. They're quite happy to back a fundamentally sound project. Uh, but the point in India is that today we also don't find them attractive enough to pick up funds from them because they're not the cheapest fund going around. So if the domestic, if I take the lending from these MDBs and load the hedging cost, so they're not exactly the best lender in town for me. So. But I believe uh, MDBs can help in terms of preparing the groundwork, helping prepare the framework, 
providing, like you said, the technical assistance, which they're probably doing for us also uh, in one or two projects, helping us prepare the DPRs. Uh, but actually setting aside money, blended finance theoretically has a role. Uh, how much is happening? Not at NTPC level, that I know. But uh, if there are other guys, maybe Satish can uh, yeah. give a point of view there. Yeah, I'll supplement that. And uh, obviously, there's a clear role for the uh, blended finance uh, in the situation where we have certain emerging technologies which are yet to be proven viable from a commercial perspective. Uh, Eversource's uh, first fund called Green Growth Equity Fund, which is a $750 million fund, could not have been a $750 million fund beyond 350 if the blended finance would not have come into picture. So we have been having, after we raised around $350 million, we got uh, approval from the Global Climate Fund Korea uh, to provide a $130 million approval, whereby they said that their capital will be having a lower priority vis-a-vis -vis the other commercial capital coming in. Now that single act allowed us to go ahead and talk to a few others who are more than happy to put money now because they saw virtually $130 million safeguard against their capital not getting returned in case of a worst case scenario over there. So there is a clear need and there's a clear possibility to raise blended finance uh, going forward. The question here is that how we can influence the foreign contributing agencies for these blended finance to come in uh, and have trust uh, in the setups which we have in India to make it happen. So that's where we are. Sure. No, I think uh, uh, at least from an energy transition uh, perspective, uh, clearly uh, blended finance uh, will have to play uh, a pivotal role. But uh, like you mentioned, at the same time, you know, adequate framework, support, uh, adequate project preparation will be critical so that, uh, you know, agencies providing concessional capital, uh, you know, get that kind of comfort. Uh, continuing on the on the green theme, I'd like to turn to Akshay. Uh, 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 as a, Serentika as a platform uh, provides uh, round-the-clock kind of solutions to industrial and hard-to-abate uh, sectors. How are you seeing availability of financing and uh, uh, cost of financing from CNI projects? Clearly, they're slightly different, uh, both from a contracting perspective as well as from a regulatory standpoint as compared to utility scale projects. So how are you seeing the financing situation there and any thoughts around the green financing part of it? So uh, CNI projects are obviously uh, different from the utility scale projects where the supplies to either the discounts or, or SECI as acting as an intermediary. Um, and then there are various risks that are uh, prevalent in the CNI sector. One of them is the uh, changing dynamics of charges that get applicable on the energy being um, consumed under this framework. Having said all of the uh, uh, above, uh, we're seeing very decent appetite for funding of CNI projects. In fact, I have to give credit to uh, the government-backed uh, NBFCs, uh, the PFCs and the RECs of the world. Uh, they are completely uh, backing uh, the government's uh, agenda of enabling more B2B electricity uh, markets, which is um, an industrial customer sitting anywhere in India should be able to procure renewable energy power being generated anywhere else in India through the central grid. There are many um, government-led uh, uh, you know, incentives on, on this. And when I say incentives, it could be in the form of uh, just the charges being waived off um, or, or a better uh, uh, banking facility available for, for renewable energy. Uh, so, uh, I would say the, the availability of funds has been decent, not at par with what you would see for a SECI uh, uh, project, uh, but it has surprised us to see the kind of liquidity that's there in the market. Okay, thanks, thanks for those uh, inputs. Um, I think uh, as we uh, integrate renewable energy, uh, uh, you know, looking at smart and digital solutions, uh, will become critical and I'd like to bring in uh, uh, Mr. Raval here. 
I think your organization plays a very enabling role here. So um, what are some of the challenges, risks that you are seeing associated with uh, uh, green financing in particular uh, for projects in the smart metering or digital solutions space? And how, what, what are you doing to address some of these issues? Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for having us. Uh, so we are on to more on digitalization in the distribution sector and uh, typically driving smart metering currently. Uh, so let me just give a small perspective to the situation uh, when we talk about sustainability transition, energy transition, where we stand. Um, and this is a distribution sector related company's perspective. So yesterday, I'm sure all of us would have read that in September, country hit the 240 gigawatt of peak demand, which is the highest ever. And we had shortage after long time. Shortage is a very beautiful word, a th a word when it comes to energy. Small amount of shortage, as we say, some amount of inflation is great for the nations which are growing. Small amount of shortage is a great thing for the sector. So it has started happening because it triggers new and new sources. But in the current perspective, when we are talking about a typical dilemma, it's, it's not a dilemma, it's, it's a situation which you have to face as a developing nation, particularly like India, where you are growing very fast, you are the fastest growing nation in the world. At the same time, you have kept very steep goals of energy transition. So you are stuck between energy security and energy transition. You cannot wait things to come up while you have to meet the shortages. But that's a beautiful, uh, complex or problem to face. So coming to the point which you were making, why I brought this was, this is the situation which is going to continue with us up to 2030 and then 2040. Because we have committed a very, very steep net zero goals. We have committed to 500 gigawatt of renewable. We have committed to very large, steep growth in the country. This will require serious balancing between fossil and conventional. You will have to come fast with the renewables. You will have to go for innovations, as Honorable Minister said. But you can't actually wait. So then, it means that alternate has to pace up in economics as well as in need fulfilling. Nobody is going to wait. Fossil will continue because that is the main supplier. Today, even when we talk, we have so much of renewable and it's at very fast pace. In energy sense, we are around 12 to 13 percent. In capacity sense, we are there, but we are not there in energy sense. Why? Because PLFs of typical solar would be around 18, 20 percent, while PL of uh, thermal could be 90 or 100 or 100 plus also at times. That's the difference, and that requires massive investment into energy transition. The estimates uh, actually tell that about 4.5 trillion dollar is the expectation of capex by 2040. We today are at less than 3 trillion by the way, as a country on the GDP side I'm saying. So this is the kind of demand the sector is throwing. And whether funds are there, yes. Funds are there, what has to be there is the economic sense of the projects. Right, because there are too many new innovations coming and they're all welcome, but they have to start making financial sense. Funds are in no deficit, there's no dearth of funds. I'm seeing smart metering, when I started my first project in SAM, which is typically a DBFOT model, and it was purely project finance project, we really struggled for some time to make market realize and understand that these are very sustainable projects and these are critical for renewable integration. I'll just spend a few seconds on this. If you have renewables and don't have the demand side management properly done up and you don't have hydro, you don't have gas, when I'm saying don't, don't have, I'm talking about sufficiency. Then how do we maneuver through the grid? Because these are variability, serious variability. You're adding massive variability into the grid. You will have to have top class demand side management. This can only happen when you have control. Controls could be achieved through significant digitalization which is to be driven by smart metering. Smart metering is just first step, just initial step of the smart grid and having a resilient grid. So all these instruments have to come together. 
to make these projects really viable, tenable, and market has to understand these are really viable projects. And we got good funding in first project. And let me tell you, in smart metering, there's perfectly no deficit of financing, and it's being considered as uh, green financing. So let's make financial sense of these projects while we are required to go through this transition. Sure, thanks. Uh, I think uh, what you're essentially saying is uh, advanced metering projects, uh, uh, they promote sustainability in a way through efficiency improvements. And uh, I think from, a, from an investor lens, uh, they are long-term contracts, annuity cash flows, uh, payment security through bidding guidelines. So I think uh, uh, they form a good case for uh, green, attracting uh, green capital. Um, I'd like to just slightly shift gears uh, and uh, talk about uh, the cost of funds. Uh, Mr. Mandana, I'd like to get your thoughts around, you know, how are you seeing the cost and the flow of funds uh, getting influenced by uh, the higher global interest rate uh, situation that uh, is kind of panning out? And uh, a basis that uh, uh, are you... Uh, from, an, uh, from a return expectation point of view, is there a sort of a change in stance? Normally, an uh, infrastructure project, uh, be it in energy sector or be it any other infrastructure sector, is a long-term uh, project. It's not uh, a cost recovery or a returns recovery in five years. It's like a 15, 20, 25 years concession that you talk about. And in those 25 years, we'll go through multiple cycles of uh, interest rates going significantly up and coming down over there. So in reality, uh, the current situation where the inflationary pressures uh, in global economies, particularly developed economies, have created a havoc uh, in those countries temporarily, uh, purely from the financial market interest rate perspective. Uh, India has been lucky enough to have not got influence as much. But having said that, a two and a half, three percent, let's say two and a half percent increase by the RBI over the period, and now they are holding on for last few sessions, uh, have not resulted into two and a half percent increase in the actual project uh, interest rates at the ground level. And most of them have been around half a percent to less than one percent interest rate increase over there. And uh, all of us look upon long term uh, scenario. And to that extent, the current decisions of return expectations uh, have not really got influenced. So the return expectation, for example, in a CNI project of 15% plus or, a, or in a Seki NTPC project of a 13% onwards still remains the same. It has not got changed to a 15% and 18%. That's not happened. Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks for those thoughts. Uh, uh, getting into some specific uh, you know, instruments, uh, I'd like to bring in uh, Akshay here. Um, so we discussed that you know there is a potential uh, gap that we're likely to see in conventional sources of financing. Uh, sp in specific, what are your thoughts around uh, uh, dipping into uh, green and sustainable finance? We're seeing green bond issuance, social bonds. We're also seeing some sustainability-linked instruments uh, which are coming in. Uh, so what is your thoughts around its uh, utilization, uh, you know, its ability to scale up, costing, etc. Uh, and what can be done to kind of improve that? And there maybe I, I'd request if we can bring up the, uh, the results of this poll on the screen, maybe uh, it'll give Akshay also some happy to hear your thoughts around that. Can we have the uh, results of the poll also on the screen? Maybe you can start and it'll just... Yeah, uh, look, uh, you know, fortunately, infrastructure has two distinct phases, right? One is uh, the under construction or what we call the development plus construction stage. And then you have the operational stage, which is pretty much secured by either a long-term concession contract or long-term offtake contract. I think uh, it's safe to say that there's no dearth of capital right now uh, for the under construction stage. Uh, but the problem is that quantum of capital will keep depleting if you don't replace that with something that comes in the operational stage. So what I fear is that we should be good for the next couple of years. Uh, but if you don't refinance that capital, uh, you probably will start running out of 
the main fuel in the under construction stage uh, which is where some of the products that you're talking about should come in which is during the operational stage where it's a lot more stable where it's essentially underwriting cash flows from a contract from a reputable off taker uh, or a concessionaire uh, some of these products which are either retail oriented large pension fund oriented um, any institution which has a green color to it it is safe hence it should be priced appropriately uh, that 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 is how i see the transition happening uh, to, to be honest so I, i don't see that world being very far away where uh, we we start attracting that kind of capital but i think we need to see the scale of the current set of projects transitioning into the operational st uh, stage and then probably you know the world's a oyster sure no those are good thoughts i think what you are also uh, talking about if i zoom out and uh, look at the larger picture what you are saying is uh, you know uh, capital during construction and once the project gets operationalized uh, one can look at a refinancing and potentially also look at uh, from a big picture perspective take out financing where you know some of those uh, 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 loans from commercial banks can be pulled out by agencies such as you know ifcl etc who can do take out financing to uh, fund those projects um, uh, but again just a thought uh, mr madana what is your uh, uh, thought around uh, sust availability of sustainable funds are gps also uh, you know looking at launching further such sustainable funds and you know what is the thought around that Uh, there's a clear trend of gps uh, looking to launch sustainable funds or launching pockets of sustainability within their current funds itself uh four years back there was no class of sustainable finance virtually uh, the world for us was divided into either is a private equity or infra equity or impact uh, there was a three broad buckets from where we used to raise funds globally Uh, today there is a clear emergence of uh, a sustainable financing uh, which is a kind of a mix across the three virtually uh, but this is still limited to certain larger pockets only it is not something which is uh, yet become the mainstream so the pace of gps trying to get onto the bandwagon of sustainability which is great for the country and great for everybody uh, is much higher than the pace at which the funds are getting earmarked towards the sustainable operations uh, in a global fund pool okay thanks thanks um i'd like to uh, turn to mr bhargava once again um again coming to energy transition uh, financing of energy transition a vibrant carbon market can also play a potential role in financing such technologies so what is your thoughts on the role of the carbon credit market and how do you really see that panning out over the long term so carbon market uh, i believe the discussion has been going around now for what uh, 12 years since we had the cdm thing it went up went for now again we're talking good about carbon market so yes we are all hopeful the problem today is that uh, in india uh, the government has only recently launched the carbon market paper and uh, we are quite hopeful that things will become clear as we go along uh, when we are looking at when we are looking at the compliance market and when we are looking at the voluntary market so how does it really stack up uh, what we understand initially uh, while government is very clear on the compliance market on the voluntary side i believe there are still some discussions to happen to uh, bring out a clear framework the second is also some kind of ambiguity as of now in terms of how much we can actually how much the government would like to in, include in the ndc targets and how much they like to allow the entities to uh, actually take forward in terms of adding to the bottom line so so these are still things which are in the works i believe but as a philosophy in general yes uh, uh, i believe quite a few of the ipps are actually factoring in the carbon market numbers also when we do the projections uh, not for us of course uh, we don't do that but uh, i believe a lot of uh, again uh, satish is sitting here who's actually green lighting a lot of the projects of the ipp so i really don't know uh, but just quick two points i wanted to make uh, on uh, earlier discussion also if it's okay with you 
One, Mr. Rahul said shortage is beautiful. Uh, that is something I'm not very sure shortage is beautiful today. Because at NTPC, we are actually burning the midnight oil to ensure that the lights are on. Uh, and, and come what may, uh, 240 gigawatts was a very good number to have, a very good, you know, top line number that the Indian thing has gone up to 240 gigawatts. But believe me, it's, it's not something we are ready to meet every day and uh, with all the sources. So uh, we would assume that the growth happens. Definitely all of us look for growth because that is how the power sector or the energy sector will grow. Uh, but right now, uh, the growth is faster than how we're able to meet the demand. So that's something which is why the growth of renewables, uh, growth of every source of energy today is being pushed by the government. I uh, just wanted to add some more color to what I think Akshay said on the CNDI side. Uh, and Because we are also doing a lot of CNDI projects, I believe uh, you're also doing quite a few. Uh, in fact, out of the 20 gigawatt pipeline, we're working on almost 8 to 9 gigawatts is uh, CNDI. So in terms of financing, we don't really see any difference. And I think that's what you also said, because the, the challenge for us, and I'm sure that's the same for the other IPPs as well, is that how do you mitigate the risk, yeah. which is where the issue comes. So uh, while discoms and, and SECI or NTPC back tenders are always uh, thought to be of you know, higher rating in terms of how they can be financed. So again, the same, I think, policy falls into place here. You look at the customer and where, uh, whether the entity has the capability to pay off for 25 years, uh, you know, at whatever is the agreed tariff. So, so that's a major challenge. But otherwise, uh, we don't actually see any difference in terms of the cost of finance as far as the CNI customers are also concerned. I'd like to touch upon what uh, Mohit just said. First of all, I agree with Mohit uh, in relation to the carbon markets. And the carbon markets have a huge role to play if we talk about decarbonization, uh, which is required for the green financing to happen. But coming to the CNI and unleashing the CNI market in this country, which is currently constrained by the fact that any private sector generator will look upon the credit rating or the financial health of the off-taker as a prerequisite. And in India, a discount doesn't look upon a credit rating or an off-taker. It supplies energy. It assumes that, yes, the first, if he has got money, he'll pay for the electricity. Otherwise, the factory will get shut or the business will get shut. Now, I don't know. It's a simple step of allowing a distribution company to become an agent for supply of the renewable energy for people like Akshay or us uh, to a particular client, which can be designated by us or not, can make a huge difference because then this energy is being supplied by the DISCOM, which has a regulatory power to disconnect and recover and put behind various legal action, which normally other generators may not have. And one single step can make a huge difference in terms of mitigating the risk, the so-called credit risk attached to the off-taker by having an intermediary, which is SECI and TPC equivalent intermediary in the power, not in terms of the financial health coming into the picture. And today in a digital world, we don't need to have a situation where a generator like Akshay or somebody like us would be unhappy taking an exposure on a discount which is bankrupt. You can always have an arrangement where on Amazon platform, when somebody buys a stuff, the money which we pay as a consumer, it, it automatically goes into an Amazon bank, it automatically goes into the supplier's bank simultaneously. It doesn't first go to the supplier's bank and it pays to Amazon, that doesn't happen. So similarly, we, the money need not go to Discom, because if you go to Discom, then there's a chance that you will not get recovered over there. But the mechanism is possible, and it's a win-win for everybody, because Discom will earn additional revenue by becoming an agent and distributor for that power. And it's a win-win for everybody, what should yeah, no, you're essentially talking about aggregation and yeah, please. Uh, sorry, I'll just because it triggered me a thought though, it's important to share. So we are working exactly to uh, no, uh, mitigate the apprehensions which have been expressed. And this program is exactly about that. Now you can think of the party who is taking all this risk on your behalf, eh? trying and solving distribution sector so that generation and transmission can feel better. So on the serious note, uh, exactly the point uh, which is made, the sector has issues. Uh, so by doing this program effectively, and let me tell you, it's running 
quite smoothly already about uh, 80 million meters or 80 million households or connections have been awarded to different uh, parties for uh, delivering this program about 150 million uh, uh, nodes or consumers have been bidded out by different discoms and i believe target is 250 million it's really moving very fast this will resolve this issue to very large extent you know because it is adding in two parts uh, just to be on the same page and share this data it is adding on the infra part which is the rdss infra and this is adding on to metering part so metering part is solving billing, billing and collection problem infra part is solving a tnd or typically loss problem in terms of transmission and distribution which actually was in the range of about 20 percent 50 50 is the ratio of billing and collection and about uh, similar is this. so both things are being sorted out significant investment is going and this is all on db4 t basis i think this could be a, a resolution to the larger issues being raised and another an interesting point which Tish raised is um, I have small input on that also, so I intervene. So there's already a concept of P2P. It is a point to point. Now, point to point doesn't mean only consumers. It could be small industry, large industry with certain consumers whose supply is being aggregated. In this country, you have around 4 gigawatt of solar rooftop, whereas you targeted 40 gigawatt, right? So you're falling so short because you didn't give any incentive to the guy to put solar rooftop. Today, if you can have P2P, because the guy who produces on its rooftop has no way to sell to the distribution, there's a serious gap in terms of regulatory and operational and commercial issues. If you do this blockchain-based P2P, which is already a pilot done and the regulatory mechanism is already in place, if it picks up, this problem which is being uh, discussed is uh, quite solvable. So I just wanted to share this information the way it existed. I agree with uh, Anil and uh, uh, what he didn't mention and I'd like to mention on his behalf is that he's talking about uh, infrastructure in this country, where the government of India has announced 250 million smart meters, which are prepaid meters. So if you have prepaid meters, then the whole credit risk of the discom and everything goes away to a very large extent because collections becomes much more easier over there. No, absolutely. I think uh, those these kind of structures will certainly help uh, uh, mobilize higher funds. Uh, and which is why we're seeing a beeline of equity investors behind uh, smart metering organizations also now. Um, uh, we have very limited time left, but I'll just like one question and very quick inputs from everyone. Um, you know, any thoughts around any policy and regulatory initiatives that you think uh, or any support required from the government uh, which can help further channelize, uh, you know, capital towards, uh, uh, you know, green infrastructure? Any thoughts uh, from anyone? Happy to hear. So I think uh, the biggest uh, requirement is the unanimity of uh, actual execution action between the central government and the state governments. This being a, a dual subject, uh, central government has been a forward thinker and most of the state government has been a laggard and at times an impediment rather than a facilitator. I'll give you example after example where this thing prevails. Take the example of decarbonizing the mobility in this country. Uh, we run 2,000 electrical buses, 2,000 electrical cars, and we want to use only renewable energy in our charging depots and charging stations. Government of India, some time back, changed the regulatory framework to say that anybody who is more than 200 kilowatt load should be allowed to access renewable energy in an open access system. Barring one state, no other state has gone ahead and implemented it. The previous regulatory framework was a megawatt capacity. That also was having issues with many of the states who discourage any kind of a open access. And some of the very advanced states in this country also don't allow open access of renewable energy to such people over there. Take another case, net metering. As uh, Anil was mentioning earlier, or somebody mentioned earlier, that if you are supplying energy to an institution which is not running on a Saturday and Sunday, what do you do? There's a concept of a net metering where he can sell that energy which has been generated on the rooftop to the grid. Many states have not implemented the net metering program. They don't want to intend, uh, implement the net metering program. So there's a set of issues which are there, but most important is that if there can be unanimity between the central government policies and the very state governments which are supposed to implement it. Sure, uh, Mr. Bhatt. I mean, we can always, you know, policy clarity. I, I think they referring to the number one there, or it's yeah. kind of no, in just general. Okay, in general. 
I mean, look, uh, to be very honest, I would prefer that the government stays out of the business. The biggest problem we are facing today is that government does something and all our people do something, go back to the government, now we want this. So I would assume that if there is a policy, it should remain consistent. And then government should by and large stay out of that. Why are we running back to the government at each point of time that this is not happening? I have been in multiple meetings of the RE developers and RE manufacturers. And I don't know whether I should be talking about that much here. But one of the most recurrent themes there is that this state, and which is what I think Satish also mentioned, that this state is not doing this, this state is not doing that. The constitution provides electricity as a concurrent subject. We have to agree to that first when we invest. I mean, you cannot say that the central government has in any way supremacy in act making and implementation over the state government. So that's the law of the land. What we would definitely like is if there is a law, there is an act, stick to it. And then it becomes, I mean, let's not change it every now and then so that we say in the name of policy, you know, improvement and blah, blah, blah. Because whatever issues you're raising, uh, so these are issues which a state has taken a call. I'm not saying these are good or bad for the moment. I'm, I'm sure these are very valid points which uh, he has made. And many of the developers are getting impacted with that. But the fact is electricity is like that. So when we talk about policy, uh, Yes, what I would definitely like is in terms of lending, if there are issues, probably the government can step up and support or mandate some kind of, I mean, this again, uh, an idea which is coming out from the RPO kind of thing. So where, whether there can be some kind of a renewable lending obligation on the lenders kind of thing that, yes, you have to do at least so much, which enables, uh, uh, you know, the lenders to provide funds. Uh, more funds, because uh, I think in one of your earlier presentations, you said about 22 trillion rupees is the requirement for the renewable sector alone. So if we are looking at that kind of funding for the renewable sector, and I think we need to keep in mind that energy transition is not about power sector alone. Energy transition is actually much way beyond power sector. We can only start generating green power. What we need to do is actually all the industries to shift to green, you know, reduce their pollutions, reduce the emissions, how they can become green. So that's, it's much beyond just power sector. So the amount of fund required for green initiative for energy transition, I mean, there could be a mandate or somehow government could set in place or RBI could set in place. So, so those are the kind, kind of things we would look at, not at, you know, every tweak here and there, every now and then uh, in the policies. Sure, thanks. Thanks. That's an interesting perspective. Akshay, Mr. Rawal, any, any thoughts around? Uh... No, uh, look, uh, and I completely agree. Uh, as long as the government is clear what it needs to do, uh, then all of us are on a level playing field, right? I mean, we, we need Absolutely. to compete with each other and... Um, but I think the government is doing quite a bit. Uh, and, and as was mentioned, uh, I think there are two or three critical uh, factors at play. One is a very effective demand side management, which I believe with smart meters will become the case, right? Why shouldn't all of us use our washing machine when it's a high solar hours? I mean, just, just as simple as that. And I think that's something that'll come about with, with smart meters. Second, I think uh, the government is truly emphasizing on the need uh, to expand the national grid. Uh, with the numbers I hear, there are plans to put up projects to the tune of about 3 lakh crores, which will, which will connect the length and breadth of the country. What that also means is Today, a customer could probably connect to a national grid and not necessarily the state grid. Now, does that make things slightly easier for us? I mean, uh, still untested waters, but my assumption is the more you remove layers of government, uh, it probably should be an easier task for, for the industries to, to uh, face. And third, uh, and I completely agree with uh, Satish, I mean, as long as uh, infra can remain a common infra and anyone can use it um, as, as a B2B, I think that's the ideal place for us to be. If, if today I want to procure power from Reliance and not Tata, and tomorrow from Tata and not Reliance, I should have all the freedom to do so. As long as uh, the physical infrastructure is, is commonly owned by, by whichever government or private entity, uh, but the freedom of supplier uh, is on the customer. That is the ideal scenario for the country to be in. 
Sure, Mr. Rawal, any closing remarks? No, so your time is already read, so I'll just yeah. simply agree with all the panelists on this topic. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. So I think in summary, I think what we're essentially saying from a policy and government perspective, I think, uh, uh, you know, central and state government uh, policy uniformity is uh, what is important because uh, that helps, uh, you know, roll out of infrastructure better. Um, uh, Mr. Bhargav spoke about uh, a long term policy certainty, I think is very critical because the infrastructure investments are large and uh, uh, you know, are capital intensive. So long term policy consistency becomes uh, very important. And I think Akshay, you also brought about out, I think carriage and content uh, in, in some shape and form uh, would be very critical. So thank you all for a very engaging uh, uh, discussion. Uh, Green and financing is a large and we can go on, but uh, we'll uh, call it a close now. So thank you all for your time and it was a very engaging discussion. Thank you. Thank you all the panelists uh, for sharing your views on overcoming the energy trilemma and the possible sources of sustainable fund needed for RE integration and advanced metering infrastructure. I would now request our session moderator, Mr. Pranam Master, to felicitate the panelists with the certificates for tree plantation. Pranav. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Mr. Mohit Bhargav. Mr. Akshay Hiranandani. Mr. Satish Mandana. And Mr. Anil Rawal. May I request all of you to please take a few minutes of your time to provide your inputs on today's discussion forum you can scan the QR code on the tent card to provide your feedback. The QR code is on your desks. Uh, with this, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a short tea break. We are running a bit behind time, so we would reconvene in the next 10 minutes at 12.35 for the next panel. I would request all to please take the tea and you can come and settle down at, the, at your tables to continue with the next panel. Thank you so much, everybody. is engaged in an unprecedented population scale infrastructure build out arguably the largest such continuous and on and what a panel it was with all the participants contributing and being very empathetic about the need of green financing with this background we'll move on to the next panel greening the wheels investing in sustainable mobility and transportation infrastructure i'd like to first invite on stage Mr. Akshay Purkayastha, Senior Practice Leader and Director, Transport, Logistics and uh, Mobility to, as a moderator for this particular panel. I now invite uh, the eminent panelists, Mr. Sudhendu J. Sinha, Advisor Niti Aayog. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for him, please. Mr. Suresh Goel, CEO, NHAI Invit. And Mr. Ravendra Kumar Jain, Managing Director, Dedicated Freight Corridor Corporation of India. Thank you. Uh, I would request all you to be settle down and I'll hand over the stage to Akshay to proceed with the panel. All yours, Akshay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for this panel discussion. 
investing in sustainable mobility and transportation infrastructure. I would also like to extend my special thanks to our esteemed panelists, uh, Mr. Jain, Mr. Goel, Mr. Sinha. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. It is well known that the transport sector has a strong multiplier effect on our economy. However, it also accounts for about 15% of greenhouse gas emissions. Decarbonization is undoubtedly the need of the hour. Now, we are well aware that there can be numerous pivots for achieving decarbonization. One pivot could be a modal shift in freight transportation from road to rail. Another pivot could be electric vehicles. A third pivot could be alternate fuels, ethanol blending, hydrogen, CNG. A fourth pivot could be urban mass transport systems. Before we commence today's panel discussion, I would like to start with a short audience poll. Uh, so if uh, you could just display the question on screen, like we did in the panel before, uh, would request everyone to scan their QR codes. Uh, so you all have 10 cards on your table. And in addition to the 10 cards uh, on the screens, and uh, behind us, there will be a QR code which will be uh, shown. You can scan your QR code and rank the pivots for decarbonizing uh, the transportation and mobility sector. So while they set up and they uh, put up this question, uh, it'll be behind us, uh, you know, on the screen. And uh, you can scan it right from uh, the last row at the back. I tried doing it in the previous panel. And we will flash uh, the answer somewhere once the analysis is ready. Uh, uh, let's start the panel discussion. So our esteemed panelists are going to be diving into some of these pivots and also discussing other important issues. We can start the proceedings with uh, Mr. Jain. Uh, uh, so uh, the development of the dedicated freight corridors is widely regarded as a game changer for the railway sector in the country. With improved design, operational parameters, separation of passenger and uh, freight on the rail network, it is expected to have a significant impact on rail's modal share and freight transportation, which is of course essential for reducing carbon emissions. Uh, we are well aware of the advanced stage of completion of the DFCs. Uh, the entire Eastern Dedicated Freight Corridor was, you know, recently inaugurated just last week. Uh, so the entire stretch now from Ludhiana to Sumnagar. So while, uh, uh, you know, trains have been plying for some time now on the Dedicated Freight Corridor, uh, are there any network-related challenges for the DFC or cargo owners? And what strategies will DFCCIL deploy to capture incremental traffic, particularly non-bulk and fast-moving cargo. Thank you, Akshay. <clears throat> Thank you for making me the part of this wonderful panel. Actually, firstly, I would like to let you know further about the dedicated freight corridors. Many of you are well aware, but again, just at a cost of one minute, that at the time of independence, railway share was around 85 to 90 percent in the transportation. And now after 75 years, you will wonder it has come down to 26 percent only. For any developed nation or developing nation, what we have seen that optimal intermodal transport ratio has to be maintained in the developed countries say the case of the US or China or to that extent Russia also, their rail share is more than 45%. Why? Because it is energy efficient, one sixth of the cost of the roads and also environmental friendly. That's why the railway has to be given due importance in the infra. And in railway, Indian railway, we have put so much emphasis but still, our growth from independence to till date is 20 times, but roads have improved 400 times or so. 
so anyway what is the biggest challenge for us is to improve our intermodal share in the favor of the railway also to that extent we are trying to bring it to 40% or so so dedicated freight corridor is one of this uh, initiative to improve the railway's model share right now we are working on the two corridors one is from delhi to mumbai that we call dadri to gnpt 1500 kilometers and second is from ludhiana dadri to sonagar that is 13 37 kilometer out of this 2850 kilometers we have already completed around 85% uh, that is 2400 kilometers and we are daily running more than 240 trains on these corridors so now i come to your question ki what we have done so far through and any challenges in the network or not these dedicated freight corridors are nothing but something like national highways for the railway these are the main lines and we have planned already worked and planned that the contributory routes are called feeder routes right say for example the routes from the kandla port pipao port or uh, mundra port that is adani port those railway lines have been termed as the feeder route and have been upgraded for the dfc standards now we are getting port traffic directly from those ports to the dfc junction station and bringing them to the hinterland or the ncr area in a very limited time similarly in the eastern direction also we have got connections at various junction station for the coal routes and now we are bringing from sonagar to delhi area dadri the coal loaded trains which used to, to take 40 to 50 hours now less than 20 hours or so so this reduction has created extra wagon utilization has improved the efficiency and reduced the oedm cost you will wonder that in indian railway the average speed of the normal goods train is 20 to 25 km per hour in 8 hour shift our train moves only 150 to 200 km in 24 hour moves only 550 or 600 km in dfc it has just doubled at the first instant as well we are saving so much of the fuel so the challenges is nothing but we are improving our feeder routes we are strengthening them so that we can capture maximum of the loads now what mr akshay has pointed out that we have to shift the traffic from indian railway that is the freight from indian railway to dfc that is the most easiest thing to do but what we have to do is the incremental traffic that whatsoever we have captured that has to be improved number 1 and number 2 shift from the road to the rail it is not that we are competitor to the road but we want to be at par with the roads so that the uh, the in the logistics we can have our due uh, position and for that particular reason we are working for the predictable reliable and scheduled train operations in our latest it enable operation system anybody through the mobile can see where the container or the wagon or the train is right now and what is the expected time to arrive at tkd or dadri shed or anywhere else so customer focused system and improvement in the business development are the keys for improving our working thank you thank you thank you mr jain for so nicely uh, you know giving the audience a, a summary of uh, the dedicated freight corridors and uh, you know your strategy is to uh, have the modal shift from road to rail specifically uh, based on enhanced customer service and predictability and reliability Uh, just a quick uh, comment from uh, mr goel on this uh, regarding you know the whole shift of uh, in freight transportation from road to rail uh, mr goel uh, would you have any uh, view of this uh, how do you see the uh, larger picture and the movement and uh, the modal split going forward sure <clears throat> so first of all uh, thank you for inviting me for the conference and uh, it's a bit nostalgic i was there at the first conference and i was just joking with samir that um, and i was telling mr shah that uh, this is one of the very few conferences and uh, kudos to crystal to have stuck on to the infrastructure as a theme uh, over these years uh, it is very fashionable to talk about fintech and you know uh, drones and all the kind of stuff but infrastructure is what you know enables the country to grow and uh, you know railways roads 
uh, aviation, et cetera, ultimately drive the growth of this country. Now, we are on a very important point of sustainability here. And I, before I come to your question, I'll just you know, suggest just one more point to this, that while there is a common perception that we need to move the goods from road to rail, right? Or um, you know, roads are more polluting or lead to less sustainable uh, outcomes. But I think what we need to think about this as, as a country, as an ecosystem, right? The fact is that the first requirement is for the country to grow, and the second one is for the country to go sustainable. Now, if we have to achieve that, then at various points in time, various strategies need to be implemented, right? DFC is relevant today, but I just like to share some stats around how national highways, just the national highways, on two initiatives only have led to significant savings on both uh, you know, carbon dioxide emissions as well as forex. Uh, the first one being plain and simple building good quality highways around the country. The fact is we country, as a country we need to grow, right? Appreciate that DFCC needs to uh, come into being, but the country needs to grow and the goods need to move. So I'm sure uh, Mantriji would have spoken about how the national highway network has doubled in the last 10 years or so, right? So we added roughly about 70, 70, I think 77,000 odd kilometers of new national highways. And I'm just quoting from the NHI sustainability report, just building of these good quality highways, and I'm sure all of you in this room would have traveled and you would have seen higher capacity trucks, bigger trucks, high, high speed, um, you know, that, that speeds that are available for us to drive on um, and just lead to lesser emissions, right? So just that has led to 642.95, let's round it out to 650 million tons of carbon dioxide emission savings in the last 10 years, right? And that's roughly on, on an average basis about 32 million ton. I just did back of the annual calculation, it's not their report. One megawatt solar plant is 730 tons of carbon emissions. If I just do the simple maths, it's about 44 gigawatts, mind you, 44 gigawatts of solar capacity having been installed in the country, right? So I think the, now coming to a question that you asked me is that, I think the national highways have played a very important role. They continue to play a very important role. And I'm sure they'll continue to play an equally important road, role as the DFCC comes into being. Because it is not that our country is a finite box and it, you know the, the cargo will move from A to B. I think as we grow forward, it will only accelerate our growth. And if commercial traffic is roughly growing at 0 0.8, 0 0.9x GDP, and the GDP long-term expectation is, if you ask DK, he would say, 6%. So we are expect, going to expect a cargo growth of about 5%. So there is just a massive amount of cargo growth that's going to happen. So we need just not one DFCC, not two DFCC, maybe multiple DFCC for us to grow and grow sustainably. Thank you, Mr. Goel. I think, I think the point that it's an entire transport ecosystem is such a pertinent point. And we are not competing uh, the modes are not competing with one another, but they're complementary to each other to take the entire country forward. Uh, I think that's a very powerful statement. So if we can move to Mr. Sinha, uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, while Mr. Sinha has a very uh, you know strong background in the railways as well, I think I'll uh, pose a question related to your current role in Niti Aayog, more on the uh, electric vehicles uh, part of it. So. Uh, you know, financing of electric vehicles is still a challenge, especially in the E2 wheeler, E3 wheeler segment, uh, where financiers are still uh, unable to perceive the resale value of the vehicle and hence building in the differential risk. In fact, uh, uh, you know, studies have indicated that the EMI for this segment is almost 40 to 80 percent higher than ICE internal combustion engine counterparts. World Bank has also come out with a program called Evolve, uh, along with SIDBI, uh, for funding of electric vehicles. While it's at a nascent stage, uh, you know, has the Niti Aayog sort of assessed how effective uh, such a program is? And not only the World Bank specific program, 
but what more is the government doing uh, regarding the whole funding ecosystem for electric vehicles? If you could throw some light on that. So thank you, thank you for inviting me on this occasion. So India has taken to electric mobility and uh, among some 50 odd countries which are into this stream, as of now we are fastest in the pace of this transformation. You may say in percentage terms we are less, yes we are. In absolute terms we are much more, that is there. But the pace of transition is definitely one of the best. So what every 17 to 20 second one vehicle is getting on the roads, every five odd minute one vehicle, one car is getting you know, on the road, every two and a half hours one charging station is coming on the streets. So this is what the pace is. So it is absolutely written on the wall, the speed at which we are moving. And that is the reason why internationally we are being sung for. Yes, financing is a big challenge. Access to affordable finance is a challenge. For the two wheelers and three wheelers, it is more uh, or the more so, especially for the three wheelers, where we see that uh, the, the interest rates are, are, are quite usurious. So, you know, we started, uh, you are aware that NITI is taking it forward. There's a national mission on transformative mobility with pace at NITI. So we started this problem in some, some, uh, sometimes in say 2020 end. We started, you know, on how to sort it out. So my CEO was a golfing partner of the SBI's chairperson. So I thought that, okay, let me try if golf can do some wonders for the country. So I wrote them in and as it was, the chairperson SBI almost like he promised that yes, we will become, you know, this is the national mission and we are going to be the, the, the program uh, the kind of uh, we coordinated for this particular initiative. But we realized that, you see, it was not all that easy. So, okay, midway I was entering into conversation. I learned all the, all the finer points of golf, but the money was not coming in. So, finally, where we realized was that SPI was, you know, there are many doubts. And it, I was finding it very difficult to dispel those clouds. So, I decided that, okay... First loss risk sharing instrument could be the best initiative to start with. And then World Bank was roped in. But then again, conversation was going on. The results were not coming. in. So a stage came in where I gave in and I thought that, okay, I have to now, I mean, it is, it is getting, time is ticking away. And let me see that what else could be done. So two things I initiated. A, I thought that, okay, let me take it to a, the entire EV financing, let me take it to the stream of, of uh, uh, PSL, so priority sector lending. And that sanction has to come from RBI. So that was one initiative on which we started. And second one was that let's open up as many channels as possible. So like SIDB, ADB, World Bank, everybody, like we just opened it, whoever was willing to help. As it was, the first initiative fell flat. So wherever I had more of trust, I was getting deflated. So they, uh, this uh, RBI people, they came with a one page argument. Of course, that was after three months of very continuous kind of, you know, talking through them. And then they said that probably it will not, they will not be able to push it through. They will not be agreed to it. So they were little, you know, uh, sympathetic with me that, uh, uh, you know, I'm a little disappointed. So I said, no, I'll be raising my, not my voice, I'll be raising the standard of my arguments and I'll come back again. So it's time for me to bounce back to them that, okay, this should be doable. This is what it has happened all over the world. But yes, the channels which I opened up, that proved to be, you know, that was the real game changer. So Sid came to our rescue, but also, yes, again, the, the CMD was an old college friend. So in my room only, I convinced him and talked to him regarding leap of faith and all those things. And then he finally agreed for what we know, EV for Eco Mission 50,000. 
So he decided, okay, let's support, let's allocate and support some 50,000 odd vehicles and let's see how it goes. And as uh, it is, I was made to understand that it is doing so well that they are going to ramp up the allocation, increase the allocation and take it forward. Now other agencies are also getting interested into it and I'm now linking them to CIDB and other partners that how it can be taken forward. This is how the scenario has been. World Bank has been quite instrumental and there are evolved programs you know, that is, of course, that needs to be, that is almost at the last stage that will be taken to D and all. This is how we are taking it forward. Now, over this period of time, of course, that's the, the initial, these two and a half kind of years that we have spent in, the, the so much of doubts with respect to EV financing that has also come down. So the lending percentage have come down. I mean, the rate of uh, interest which are being charged, that is gradually it is coming down. And as you rightly said, the more and more resale value gets stabilized. The, the, the thing is that resale value comes only with the passage of market. It is not a, not a deliberation or a meeting or a kind of, you know, but still we are trying to work out that how from a scientific perspective, we can work out the resale value, A, and B, how faster the market can mature so that the resale van value can be stabilized, and then all these things should be sorted out. My sense is that within a year or so, there should be a major uh, drop in the interest rate with respect to EV finance, and then it should be sorted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sina. I, I think it's very heartening to hear that and to hear, you know, of the initial success of the Evolve program. Uh, two learnings from this. Uh, one, golf is a great connector. Uh, second, of course, any transform, transformative journey will take time. But while you keep trying, different avenues will open up and it will take its course. So. Uh, so yes, uh, you know, very optimistic about the future, about adoption of EVs and, uh, you know, let's hope uh, for the entire nation that this uh, takes off as successfully as we all wanted to. Just moving on um, uh, to Mr. Goel again. So over the last four to five years, we have witnessed, uh, you know, quite a few changes in the roads and highway sector. And uh, the audience would have heard the Honorable Minister, uh, you know, in the inaugural address speak about those. So I won't repeat it. But uh, there have been positive steps towards sustainability. Some top of the uh, top of the mind recall is the entire fast tag uh, rollout, the use of recycled materials in construction, enhanced congestion management, plantations, uh, etc. And uh, sustainability parameters are going to gain more importance in investment decisions going forward. So the question here is that, do you look at any specific sustainability areas as investors, operators uh, in the roads and highway sector? And what are the international good practices that India can further adopt in this regard? It's a very broad question. <laughs> You're only 25, 25 minutes here. <laughs> um, see, I think the, uh, first of all, uh, sustainability has become real. When, um, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a student of uh, infrastructure finance, right? That, that's my uh, calling and that's what I've seen. Um, it was a fad word. It was just a fad. Everybody wanted to talk about it. Uh, now it has reached a stage in which it's an essential item for one to do diligence on, right? And and have a view on how you're going to enhance sustainability, right? And I mean, if I kind of mirror it to how Crystal uh, has also started to track uh, ESG, uh, right? For, for the corporations and all kind of stuff. And if you take a step back, uh, see, today we don't live without ratings at all. Just, just a rating. It's a part of our lives, any organization, any instrument, even without an instrument, you want to have a rating and you want to have a crystal rating on top of it and all kind of stuff. But it is not very long time ago that the ratings gained prominence in the country. Right? I mean, I just went back to see that. It was only 1988 
Chris Hill was set up. I mean, I started my career in 1995, and you know, it was uh, we were the early ones, and when when Chris Hill started to recruit from the IMs and stuff to like that, and and even then, ratings was just being accepted into the market. I mean, everybody was staying over term term loans and stuff. But let's assume that you reached some you know general acceptance. Let's say another 2,000 or thereabouts. So 20 years. So if we try to mirror the same thing onto sustainability now, just kind of linking the dots here. So from just a fad to an essential part of uh, agenda. Uh, and one is not defining sustainability in terms of what is to be done, but more importantly, first of all, I think we are at a stage as an industry to start collecting data. So any investment, I mean, uh, just by way of introduction, I uh, represent the NHI Invit, which is uh, a National Highways Infrastructure Trust, which has institutional investors in, into it, right? And these investors are very suave, very sophisticated. Each one of them have their own agendas on the ESG side that they have to meet. Uh, and so these are the capital providers, capital allocators. So, so they are just beyond policy, but they are looking to see actual outcomes. So I think it's become a norm now, and Crystal is one of our partners, to define and do diligence on what exactly is happening on the highway, right? And that holds true for other infrastructure asset classes also. Um, then we move to the next stage in terms of saying, okay, this is where we are as a datum, and then how do we move forward? So there is no best practice as such, I can say, that yet to be achieved. Uh, I think we have to consider this more as a journey uh, the fact that the capital is available now only if you have a sustainability strategy is a great motivator. As uh, Mr. Drucker said, only if it can be measured, it can be managed. Right Now we have reached the stage of measurement. Uh, I'm sure looking at the ecosystem, we will start to achieve rainwater harvesting. We will start to achieve you know, uh, like Sinaji said, you know, electric vehicles, right, financing, but at the same time, uh, charging infrastructure would need to come in. So I think that's how we should look at sustainability uh, as a whole, um, rather than just saying that, you know, we will achieve one item or the other item. I hope a bit long-winded answer to your question, but that's the only best I can do. No, it completely answers it. I, I think uh, the importance of sustainability strategies going forward uh, can't be highlighted more. So I think that uh, really summarizes it. If you move back, uh, I think, to the dedicated freight corridors, uh, Mr. Jain. So uh, like you mentioned itself, uh, you know, the dedicated freight corridors are expected and quite clearly will lead to an increased modal share in uh, rail for freight transport. So. And they're also supposed to help in reducing the overall logistics cost in the country. And there is a lot of emphasis on this. Now, an argument from industry is that this reduction can only be achieved if tariff on the DFCs is rationalized uh, to reflect higher capacity, efficient operations, uh, etc. So, what is the view of DFCCIL on this uh, tariff rationalization? And in your opinion, what could be the best way forward to achieve this objective of reduction in logistics costs? Very interesting question, Akshay. That everybody feels that uh, with the DFC construction completing, and uh, average speeds have improved, wagon turnaround has improved, <clears throat> O&M cost has reduced. So whatsoever savings are there, why those should not be passed on to the customer directly? I will just uh, cite one example of Department of Post. You may remember, they used to have simple letters, postcard, envelopes like that, Antardeshi Patra. Then they brought a second model, second product, that is registered AD. In the first case also, they were assuring that the letters are to be delivered. And in second case, they made it assured delivery through registered AD. Then they brought third product, a speed post. Yes, it is speedier and assured delivery. 
in the case of dfc we have brought railway from the latter stage to the speed port stage but we have not enhanced any extra cost so not enhancing any extra cost is also a saving to the customer number 1 we have saved in terms of the time that now the commodity is reaching to his destination much early saving in time number 2 interestingly say in powerhouses where the critical stocks were required for four weeks or more than that now where the dfc is providing the coal the critical stock they by themselves have reduced it to 14 days or so so 14 days reserve stock reduction is a saving of 300 400 crores for each such powerhouses and similar is the case for the other units also so we are the enabler to the railway in a sense that we are the faster heavier longer and higher also and sending to the customer at the fastest available route you will surprise to note that in the case of the railway only 700 meter train runs in our case western dfc we are providing double stack container one container above another and that too in the longer length 1.5 km so instead of one train we are taking from the port only in one train we are taking four equivalent trains of the indian railway so this is the faster and the quicker clearance from the port there the port efficiency is also improving they are also gaining and at the destination we are sending them at the much earlier you please see the one more interesting example right now we are running trucks on train from palanpur we are bringing the milk trucks loaded on our flat wagons daily 25 trucks as an experimental basis basis to the ncr area those trucks used to take 30 hours refrigerated trucks 30 hours traveling from palanpur to the delhi area now they are coming through dfc up to a particular point in 12 hours and then they are entering in 4 hours to the delhi area so approximately 10 hours saving in the truck due journey number 2 their refrigeration cost of 10 hours is getting saved so it is a saving so we have worked for the reduction in the logistic cost and it should not always be considered that the reduction means the tariff should reduce so one more thing should be very clear that we are part and parcel of the indian railway we are not competitor to the indian railway we are governed with the tariffs of the railway which they are uh, getting approved through the parliament also so we have to follow the same tariff but we are improving the quality of service and through that quality of the service we are otherwise reducing the logistic cost thank you mr jain i think that's a very compelling argument so don't always look at tariff rationalization look at enhanced service quality and reduction in cost in the entire supply chain uh, when you're looking at reducing over logistics cost uh, uh, let's hope that's a view point that is appreciated by industry as well Uh, but it's a very compelling argument i'll just come to mr sinha also to uh, take your views on this regarding the overall reduction in logistics cost and just two inter uh, linked questions so one re uh, related to you know the entire electric vehicle ecosystem uh, so how will that lead to a reduction in uh, logistics cost uh, so that's part a part b is relating to the entire charging infrastructure so till now we have seen that the government has been encouraging uh, you know particularly the oil marketing companies to set up ev charging stations but does the government have any long term road map uh, to set up charging infrastructure which is essential for increasing adoption of evs okay so the way you said that uh, logistics yes logistics cost if uh, the movement is on green that is always you know it has got positive impact on the logistics cost because the fossil fuel the gasoline that we are using most of them are you know imported stuff so in addition to the loss of uh, precious foreign exchange it has got so many other bearings environmental impact is another one of them <clears throat> so more and more we are shifting towards electrification that will have a positive impact 
and just to you know appreciate railways railways have given that by 2030 they are going to be net zero so that is what the commitment is so and i'm sure that uh, the way they have uh, planned it out they are moving on the right track and i and uh, my sense is that they should be able to achieve it maybe a year or so earlier <coughs> that is what they do normally so this is one portion and yes charging infrastructure is one of the critical uh, areas that needs to be addressed <coughs> so countries after country if you see they have got very dedicated focused kind of approach towards charging infrastructure so we have got in france if you see there is a program called advenir in finland they call it evelina in ev rom is in new zealand countries after country they have got you know how to go about setting up of charging infrastructure in india also we have got a we have got into it this spectrum and that is the reason why it is moving so fast the government's understanding is very clear we want this to be developed as an independent and kind of attractive business opportunity government as a government one doesn't want it to be taking doing it on our own but yes just to instill confidence to the private sector that yes this is a viable option this is a good opportunity government is in this spectrum given given a choice we would have loved that the entire thing is taken forward by the private people but yes <clears throat> for that lot of you know challenges are there one needs to know that what should be the combination of fast and slow charging of course that has been sorted out because from the same equipment both fast and slow charging can be done now so within a fortnight ago bis has come out with standards whereby from the same unit fast and slow charging can be done so that is one thing you will see as we move on this journey the vehicles and the quality of batteries and all those things will keep on improving so the range will keep on moving fast so maybe two and a half three years back two and a half years back the cars that we have who have our own oems they were what they were hitting somewhere close to 70 80 kilometers in one charge today this is 350 km in one charge i am not talking of the up end cars i am just talking of those which are kind of in 10 15 lakh bracket less than 15 lakh so this is this will keep on moving forward charging stations are also you know that is moving fast so we have a representative from you know reliance who is there and uh, the moment he saw me he told me he is my inaka position i have asked and he will be sending it to you because that is the first question which i ask ki abhi tak kitna lag gaya so they are aware the pehla question yahi hoga so just to evade that wo pehle hi bata dete hain ki abhi position aapke paas bhijwa rahe hain so this is how the position government through the omcs and we have asked oil marketing companies can you imagine what a what a change in approach it is that we are telling them in a way that from the proceeds of your oil get into the setting up of charging infrastructure <coughs> so these two are kind of you know antithetical to each other but that is what we are proposing to 22000 charging stations they are expected to set up they have been mandated to set up all three oil companies and bp is of course the front end and we have given them money also for all the upstream infrastructure which is a major costly challenge into it because as you you kind of saturate the charging infrastructure the grid stability becomes a challenge the 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 substations need to be required all those things are there so that is being sorted out we have given them close to what 8000 uh, crore rupees has been given to them and they are going to set up uh, uh, charging stations and from this september onwards they were supposed to be giving us the report that how many have been set up so all these three oil marketing companies they are going in addition to that the private players they are doing fabulous so they are doing taking it forward and the state governments have also decided on some new concepts there is a concept called green corridor green corridor is a stretch of road on which which is completely enabled with charging infrastructure similarly the highways i think some 4500 km highways they have decided that that will be 
you know saturated with charging surges as you move on in one direction after say every 50 km or 100 km 75 km you will be hitting one charging stations the wayside amenities that is being developed there are also charging infrastructure being a part of it so so many things are happening in the charging infrastructure and the the uh, rate of installation that has gone up many fold has come if you compare them in the last two years and with the battery swapping yeah, as it is you know that is also getting into the stream with that getting into this uh, the uh, position my sense is that you know this problem will be solved to a substantial level yes thank you mr sinha I, i think that really gives a good perspective to the audience and i technology is evolving as an unprecedented rate so i think uh, that goes without saying and if the government can be an enabler give a stable policy environment facilitate uh, and if there's a viable business uh, proposition then private sector will of course jump at the opportunity which we are seeing uh, as well so i, I think that uh, really uh, does help a lot sir if we uh, move to mr goel and coming back to financing so green financing is seeing a upward trend in terms of demand uh, so while the market for specific instruments will take time to mature from a regulatory policy market debt perspective do you see any role of infrastructure investment trusts or the roads and highway sector in general in availing green financing and second question is irrespective of this what role do you think domestic capital can play in the development of infrastructure um so i think the point one here with regard to green financing is that uh, uh, i think we are moving to a stage in which most institutional financing would become green i think uh, just connecting to the previous answer that i gave uh, that i think the capital has started to segregate normal opportunities and green opportunities i think there is still an element of premium prestige whatever name you call it that is attached to uh, the project being green uh, sustainable etc uh, i think most most large institutions and you know we are talking about institutions not in the scheme of i'm talking about international institutions not in the scheme of billions of dollars i think more, quite a few of them are uh managing assets worth a few trillions of dollars and just like um you know we spoke about indian railways having a net zero target of 2030 uh most organizations or these investors around the world have a target to gradually move their portfolios towards green so i think at where we stand today uh i think the market is still a bit patchy uh the depth of the markets and the quantum of money that we can talk about is not significant but the fact is that if an organization does not have a green strategy or does not have an element of strategy that can attract green funds or sustainable funds or pools of capital that are looking to do that uh, today it may appear as if it is uneconomical or takes too much effort for you to get you know get that financing done but believe you me uh that is the balance sheet balance sheet side of your business in which you have to make this investment in terms of effort in terms of preparing your organization to meet those standards etc because uh, i'm 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 a proponent of gradual growth so it's not a switch that will happen one day and says okay now we are green and we are going to have all the green financing coming through i think it's the incremental steps that we take as an organization as a country which then becomes makes it more and more relevant for those institutions um so that is one for example no longer one is talking only about world bank and ifc 10 15 years ago when i started investing in infrastructure the only people who talked about green financing were you know these multilats now you go to blackrock you go to blackstone you go to cpp you go to uh, gic everybody would want to exactly what's happening uh, on the green financing side the second aspect of it is around the domestic capital now that is where honestly and i'm not and i would really want to use this platform uh, because you have access to those institutions i think it's a bit disappointing 
because uh, the investments by domestic institutions into infrastructure financing is still very minimal. I mean, we are still not pulling the weight that we have in terms of capital being available, in terms of financialization of savings that is happening with those institutions, whether you take the pension funds, whether you take the insurance companies, whether you take the mutual funds, wherever you look at it, I think the it's only a double digit growth in their portfolios that's happening, on an average 20% or so. And the size of these institutions are also quite significant now. But are we really having conversations with them about sustainable investing? Uh, are we having conversations with them about they investing into good quality infrastructure, whether it is EV infrastructure, whether it is railways, whether it is national highways, whether it is national highway in wait, um, I think it is still very, very minimal. It's very easy to have these conversations with foreign institutions, um, but with domestic institutions, it's, it's slightly difficult. And uh, I would really appreciate if Crystal were to continue to provide platform and you know lead this debate, because that transformation is essential for us to implement anything that is being spoken about here. We can only have that much of foreign savings, but unless and until we are channelizing our domestic savings into that, uh, at some point in time, we are going to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goel. I think that's, uh, that's a very interesting perspective. And of course, Crystal will continue to provide uh, such platforms and have such conversations. So uh, I think we have time for one last question, and uh, then we'll just flash uh, the poll results. So I'll ask, I'll ask Mr. Jain uh, this question, actually, uh, coming back to uh, the dedicated uh, freight corridors. Uh, so Mr. Jain, uh, DFCCIL is going to be the infrastructure manager for the dedicated freight corridors. So responsible for maintaining the fixed and the allied infrastructure for rail operations. Uh, what are the other focus areas uh, for DFCCIL apart from core rail infrastructure. Do you see any opportunities for the private sector going forward? Are there any specific initiatives for furthering the green agenda? Dedicated freight corridor is now not uh, <clears throat> just limiting itself as a transporter, rail transporter. We are now getting converted into a logistics type company. And uh, for that particular reason, we are working in all the areas where we can take the help of the public participation. Say, to start with, we have got 120 stations. We have opened up all the 120 stations for the private participation to take those stations, develop them as a good sheds, and do the business related to the railway and related to the roads. Already we have finalized it four or five locations to begin with and where many logistic companies have participated and they have started business. Secondly, we have also entered into the area of the multimodal logistic parks. At four locations we are right now working at Nangal Chaudhary, Haryana, Rewadi, Kanpur in UP and uh, New Dadri, Greater Noida. And uh, <clears throat> here we have already tied up with the state authorities and at two places we are doing it ourselves. So these multimodal logistic parks is nothing but we converting ourselves into a logistics company. Similarly, we are also extending the connectivity to the DFC through the private, uh, to the private freight terminals. Any party interested to get the connection for their industry or their units, we will provide and welcome them for a connective, with a connectivity. We have already tied up at five or six locations in different parts of the uh, country. And these three models, GCT stations, multimodal logistics park, private freight terminals, these are to begin with. Similarly, we are working in different products, like for the automobile transportation, perishable transportations, parcel transportations, Containers, we are further improving ourselves, how to tie up with the more and more the CTOs. Similarly, for the perishables, agro products, 
and wherever there is a business we are looking for that particular area so we are now open for all type of the businesses and we welcome all private participation for joining a hand with us thank you thank you mr jain i think that really gives us a perspective of dfccil going forward uh, so if we can have some food for thought uh, so uh, can we flash the results of the poll please just want to see how the audience uh, viewed uh, that so as as you can see uh, uh, majority of the audience in fact it seems like a tie uh, so first and second so urban mass transport systems and uh, alternate fuels uh, and the minister in the morning did speak a lot about alternate fuels uh, seem to be the leading pivots as per the audience for decarbonizing the mobility and transportation sector uh so uh thanks to the audience for that and uh once again i would like to thank uh, the esteemed panelists for spending time with us today and uh, you know diving into these issues 50 minutes uh is not enough time to discuss such vast issues even one of these issues can be discussed for 50 minutes but re we really enjoyed uh the conversation and i uh, think the audience is going to go back with a much better perspective of issues uh vis-a-vis -vis the starting so thank you once again and uh, over to guranchal please thank you to the eminent panelists for discussing the uh, role of roads ro uh, railways and in the india's net zero journey as well as developing the landscape for e mobility i would now request our panel moderator akshay to please felicitate the panelists with the certificates for tree plantation uh, team can we have the certificates please for the certificates i'd request everyone to please fill in the feedback forms on your table or on the tent card by scanning the qr code for the panel your feedback is really important to us we we'll start with the certificates mr sudhendu j sinha advisor niti aayog mr suresh goel ceo nhai invit and mr ravindra kumar J kumar md dedicated freight corridor corporation of india thank you and thank you akshay uh, ladies and gentlemen we shall break for lunch uh, to just reconvene for the next panel in the next uh, at around 2 215 pm i would request everybody to please be on time we are making good time so we'd like to continue with the same thank you everybody and we'll reconvene after the lunch thank you for your time Having everybody coming in, I'll just move on to the next panel. The next panel is obviously closer home because discussions on sustainability would be incomplete without pondering over the transition needed in infrastructure impacting our lives in urban dwellings. i uh, just yeah okay i just have a minute yeah no i'll just bring it up i'll call you I'll call you first, and then I'll call everybody up. You check him again. Okay. You can call him and ask him to sit. I'll. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we begin with our next and the final panel for the conclave on building green infrastructure path ahead for urban infra. 
Our eminent panelists for this session are industry stalwarts and the pioneers in the urban infra space. I would request each one of the panelists as I take their names to please grace on the stage. We will have firstly Mr. Abhay Kantak, Global Head and Director, Urban Infrastructure and Public Finance and Moderator of Panel to please have them and welcome them on the stage. So we begin with Mr. Madhav Pai, CEO, WRI India. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Uma Maheshwaram Rajashekhar, Urban Resilience Advisor, Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Mr. W. R. Kumaran, ED Power and Services, DLF. I'd request the admin team to have another chair on the panel, please, because we have one of, uh, among, uh, one of us amongst ourselves for this particular panel, Mr. Manish Gupta, Deputy Chief Ratings Officer and Senior Director, Crystal Rating. Administration team, if you can just have one more chair on the panel, please. Ladies and gentlemen, as I highlighted, this panel would be closer home because we will be discussing about the need of sustainability in urban dwellings and urban infrastructure. We'll have Abhay moderating this panel. So I'll hand over the dais to Abhay to take it from here. Abhay, all yours. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you for joining in for a post-lunch session. Uh, we are talking about uh, building green urban infrastructure and uh, what we heard in the morning is that the buildup in the urban investments is quite significant. Uh, we need infrastructure investments for growth, but the narrative today in the era of climate change has completely changed. We just don't need quality invest infrastructure investments, but they need to be resilient and sustainable. Uh, so for to discuss this, uh, topic, very important topic and very burning topic, if I can call it. Uh, we have Madhav Pai. Uh, he is the CEO of WRI, uh, doing pioneering work in the, in the space of sustainability and uh, climate change uh, in India. Uh, we have Dr. Mahesh uh, from the uh, Coalition for D Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, a uh, New Delhi-based international organization promoted by Government of India, where 31 member countries are part of it. Uh, he is a specialist on climate change, and he's going to guide us on this session. Uh, we have also, from a very developer perspective, a leading developer, uh, DLF, Mr. Kumaran, coming in to talk about how they are building sustainability aspects in their uh, projects. And finally, we have uh, the financing perspective uh, provided by uh, Mr. Manish Gupta uh, from Crystal Ratings. So we are covering the entire gamut of uh, issues that the sector uh, needs to look at. And I'll start the ball rolling by talking to uh, Madhav and getting his perspective that climate change today is something that cities are accepting. Uh, there is no denial, probably eight to 10 years back, cities probably in a denial stage. I just, because of WRI's work uh, with various cities and state governments in India, I just want to ask him, how are cities responding to climate change? What has been WRI's experience uh, in how cities are dealing with this issue? So uh, I'll make three points. Uh, one, uh, see, we've uh, now probably worked with over a dozen cities on climate action planning, looking at resilience. Uh, one is, I think, sort of broadening the discussion beyond just mitigation to adaptation really helps because politically now cities are facing disasters, you know, that they are. So that is a conversation they want to actively have. So uh, even from the perspective of simply, right, I mean, I always give the example of Mumbai, you know, in the past, they used to be a bit worried to talk about flooding. But now that, you know, in Mumbai has like, you know, five events which are more than 200 mm, the freedom to blame it on climate change, but also then the freedom to do more innovative things to, you know, uh, engage with a broader audience 
to say that it's you know it's beyond our control so i think uh, you know it's allowed so one is that cities today are much more bolder i would say to talk about climate change to act on it because it has become a necessity politically also it's become important i think doing that sort of one and, and uh, again capacity is a serious issue lot of work is required on that front two three things i think have worked positively i would say one is you know when you know when you start doing something like a climate action plan uh, you know in mostly our cities are used to do planning means they are used to do master plans with very regulatory constraints and all of that today when you are doing a climate action plan with a net zero sort of target you know this idea of this is the vision now let's plan together and develop so it's almost like a strategic planning exercise that you are doing with the city that otherwise the city has never done right so it can be a cleaner action plan it can be some other plan it doesn't matter but the idea of you know having a target and then sort of building a strategy towards it just this exercise i think tremendously sort of helps uh, to to sort of identify projects and things that can be done so i think just that capacity has been positive so that is one of the sort of positive outcome the other thing is i mean and i think more and more we are seeing the use of geospatial uh, data right and i think just you know having these good quality maps where you are showing uh, you know in bangalore i remember we used to talk about encroachment of drains but once we were able to overlay the built up right and on top of the sort of uh, hydrology map and show 85% of the valleys and drains or the flood network was built up on then it's a non conversation whether it's happening or not right it's there you know you can see that it's now the question so you're automatically moving to solutions right so that's the other thing is i think now the use of some of these sort of data sources etc is allowing us to have these kind of conversations and and deal with some of the more challenging things right so it can be both sort of meteorological data hydrological data built up data so you and visualize it create maps so that that's what so that's been the other sort of positive thing on the challenge side of course you know i mean uh, i think there's a lot of infrastructure spending going on at least in a, and how do we make sure that you know we uh, now are able to bring these ideas uh, into those investments right even today small things are happening i mean this is still on the fringe i think mainstreaming is still the biggest sort of you know so mainstreaming localizing uh problem solving is 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 the biggest challenge and i think both sort of capacity institutions all of that have to be built and you know there i think very small steps have happened and i think much more needs to be done on that front so no, that's good to know that you know cities are taking cognizance of this challenge and moving forward you know today in the morning we had honorable minister mr nitin gadkari coming in and he talked about good quality dprs being pro- prepared so when we are preparing a new project our city is taking into account the resilience aspects in the design are there any reference codes for them to follow means with or are we preparing the same dpr all over again yes yeah, so i'm just saying so i think institutionalizing has not happened right so i think this so this is one codes is one form of institutionalizing so i think institutionalization of these things is absolutely important and actually creating the right kind of capacity so some early steps are there uh, but i think just that mainstreaming aspect as so they would do one project or you know um, uh, one sort of area or something like that right where certain actions might take place but i think we're still some distance away from this mainstreaming yeah. okay so dr mahesh uh, you know i just want to come to you on the institutional and the policy perspective like you know there is a technical aspect of making a project you know resilient in terms of in its design but what are the policy and institutional level changes or reforms that you know are required to make this uh, you know a, a constant effort rather than being an exception in terms of designing for new infrastructure projects um yeah that there, there's a lot which is happening already but uh, i'll just mention a couple of things which are needed uh, most urgently one we need planning reform urban planning reform uh, right from the change in urd pfi guidelines to the way we go about our master planning process you know our master planning process is currently once in 10 years for a reason 
because till 1990 we had a 1 to 2 percent decadal growth right now we are having that 1 to 2 1 percent annual growth in urban population so there is a huge change uh, from what it used to be and what it is right now and we are expecting more people to move into the urban areas the 10 year cycle of master planning doesn't really work uh the second thing is risk informed master planning and i think that's where we need to also really be conscious of whether currently our land use land car based master planning doesn't consider risk into uh take risk into account uh forget about climate risk even that's why uh, many of the cities are facing issues related to landslide some are in the uh, earthquake prone zones they are not taking certain considerations into play and uh, this this needs to be brought into uh, uh, a mechanism which urban practitioners can actually mainstream it until unless it's not reflected in the master plan there is no incentive for others to actually start working on it we 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 become mostly reactive and the third thing is what i would say in terms of the policy we have to move towards drf you know um, much of our infrastructural assets Uh, especially those which are owned and operated by the government entities are not insured they are insured when they are within a loan period or when they are part of a ppp process uh they take loans from these development banks and as long as the loan period last these infrastructure assets are insured but uh, apart from it they are not insured that's why when incidences like what recently happened in sikkim the government the state governments are stressed uh to come back to normalcy when you talk about resilience it is the time which takes them to rebound back to normalcy and they don't have that kind of a fund or a financial mechanism and they expect the national government to actually provide them that sometimes they get it sometimes they don't and depends upon uh the nature of the disaster so i think the drf and insuring government assets is something Uh, one needs to think about how do they go about risk pooling and since majority of our infrastructure assets are still owned and operated by the governments it it needs to be uh, managed uh, post a disaster these these are broad things but apart from it uh, you know uh, there are the other institutional policy level when you bring risk to an urban uh, areas cities in general uh, the city administration is not responsible for disaster management it is still the district administration and the state government uh whereas a majority of uh uh the people and also the contribution towards the economy uh, you know cities play a very key role they contribute currently 60% uh, to 70% uh, of the state's gdp come from urban areas when that is the case i think the risk management or the risk transfer to city administration Uh, while 74th amendment did talk about it it's not fully devolved and that needs to be mainstream broadly these are three four things which can be done you know uh, dr mahesh i think you brought out the fragmentation of institution at a city level uh, is going to be always a challenge you know means uh, you know integrating everything at a city level probably may not be the way forward so are you seeing examples in india where cities are working where multiple institutions are working together to solve uh, such challenges see uh, most of the city uh, cities irrespective of whether it's india or global uh, they are complex systems multiple institutions and multiple stakeholders do play a key role whether you talk about private uh, public and uh, also uh, few uh, universities academic institutions ngos ngos uh, and so i think we can't negate the fact that multiple institutions should coordinate of course are we creating a platform for these institutions to come together and engage right now such a platform doesn't engage exist you know until unless if there is a cyclone warning which occurs then there is a call uh, by either a state government agency or a city administration to coordinate across various departments usually that functions or that happens very well post a disaster whenever a disaster takes place then multiple agencies come together and sit and deliberate on what needs to be done 
I think we need to do it as part of the planning process. Uh, one of the examples which came about right now, much of the master planning process do uh, happen uh, in a siloed manner. It is this, uh, you know, there are urban development authorities uh, uh, which are within the cities or within the periphery of the cities and they basically do the master plan without much consultation with other departments. Nowadays, that at least has started changing. I think Tamil Nadu is leading uh, that even for the Delhi master planning, at least the consultation did take place with multiple agencies coming together. So there are uh, good practices which are emerging. Uh, I think we have to move away from post-disaster reactionary mechanism to pre-disaster planning and also that planning lead to coordinated uh, you know, actions. You know, Madhav also talked about uh, cities being constrained about you know, following a statutory planning process. Uh, you know, climate mitigation is being talked about, but these are long-term interventions. Climate adaptation seems to be the way forward. So, in terms of climate adaptation, what can the city aim to do within its jurisdiction, within its powers? See, there are multiple mechanisms which cities are doing in terms of uh, adaptation. Uh, we, we are anyway living with the floods and living with the heat. Uh, it's people are adapting to themselves. If you look in terms of uh, a private residence, uh, I think everybody has an underground tank and also over a tank to store the water to take care of, uh, you know, drought scenarios. People have their own uh, way to react to these kinds of stresses. Uh, but what uh, cities need to do in terms of uh, adaptation is, uh, I think, what is missing in India right now, urban areas are mandated to have only 12% green cover. And uh, less than 50% uh, of the cities, smart cities, uh, have 12% green cover. Uh, can you believe it? That's the state of uh, the country. I think nature-based solutions need to be promoted. That is the first and foremost thing for adaptation. It is not creating new uh, things, but at least preserving what is existing and making sure that, uh, you know, water bodies and green areas are uh, maintained and managed uh, appropriately. Uh, two, our building bylaws needs to change. Going back to my previous uh, comment, your DPF guidelines need to change, but once they change, it will also get reflected in the building bylaws because right now building bylaws uh, are not mandated to take heat into account. Uh, they are not mandated to take flooding into account. Of course, uh, now TOD has come into play, uh, which is a very good thing, but other aspects need to be taken into account to ensure that uh, there is uh, a mechanism to safeguard our assets, you know, what we are investing in uh, for these uh, climate extremes. And uh, the third thing when it comes to adaptation is uh, what comes to, uh, you know, ensuring that m most of the things which are being built take into consideration uh, the future changes. Right now, uh, we, we are not considering those future changes and what the extremes this year, uh, the July and August, uh, the global temperature has crossed 1.5 degrees. Even though on an average we say that we have crossed the 1.2 limit, uh, overall the last 200 years what we have experienced, this year we experienced, uh, why 200 years? Because that's what we have in terms of our records, right? We have exceeded that uh, this year and it's very important we start taking note of it and addressing it not as a one-off solution, as part of our everyday, day-to-day -day activities. How do you operationalize it as part of your day-to-day uh, -day activity is, is something which is very key. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Mahesh, for highlighting the you know importance of nature-based solutions because that form as a natural uh, barrier for you know for uh, the impacts of climate change. And you know, talking about rising temperatures and citizens are experiencing it. So I just want to move to Mr. Kumaran. As a leading developer of you know green buildings, what are your customers asking for? Because they are facing the challenges of climate change, and what are your commercial customers talking about 
what are your residential customers uh, you know uh, demanding and what has been dlf's experience check good afternoon everyone so in terms of uh, demand the intensity in which they were asking maybe 10 years before and what they are asking now is has changed uh, drastically uh, other than whatever we we normally provide in terms of satisfying the uh, structure code fls requirement and everything uh, and also energy efficiency uh, chillers led solar bulbs solar panels all of it now it is moved more on uh, what are your renewable energy policy what are your uh, uh, water net zero uh, policies so in in terms of asking these sustainability measures uh, abai uh, they have been very very uh, demanding in fact i can tell one reference wherein we were doing a deal in in chennai uh, one of the major client they were telling that we have a mandate that uh, the the development should have uh, 50% uh, renewable uh, energy as a mandate for them and by all uh, in terms of tamil nadu dr mahesh was telling they are little advanced and we had actually 85% of our overall energy requirements coming through renewable uh, energy so they were like okay fine this is something which we are really interested to know and and also they take these as uh, their scoring points because they also have their own sustainability mandate uh, within them so the demand has gone up uh in terms of what they ask us on the commercial uh, front because there you have all these energy guzzlers in terms of uh, the power requirement water requirement uh in in terms of uh, residential i still think that uh, it it is still in the nascent uh, stage because people look at what are the amenities they get into it uh, what what is the uh, landscape softscape in terms of natural vegetation and uh, ventilation uh, which is provided in the in the development what they look at because here it's the end user whereas in commercial it's it's the overall deal which happens at the portfolio level uh, so still residential is is at a native nascent stage but they are also becoming demanding when it comes to both amenities and also some of the energy efficiency features which you include in the design and what you deliver at the end of the day so dlf is doing this in response to your clients asking for it and there is no regulation that is pushing you to do that is good economics being a driver for for green buildings is it is it more costly or the economics are much cheaper uh, that probably motivates developers like dlf so abai i want to correct you it's not they demanding us and then we are doing it we were doing it and this became an added feature when when we uh, took it upon uh, us and showed it uh, to them so they when we say that uh, is there a regulation um, uh, no we are uh, the largest in in the globe in terms of uh, certified lead platinum uh, buildings close to a uh, 45 uh, million uh, square feet are also the largest in uh, lead uh, zero water so there were no uh, mandate from any of the tenant or or uh, the customer who asked us to do it as a practice we did it we wanted to be uh, someone who takes this to the next level and they appreciated it and they embraced it in terms of when they wanted to be uh, part of uh, the association with uh, tlf uh, now next is also in in terms of everyone talking about net zero i think uh, dr madhav pai uh, uh, mentioned about it uh, so that is something which we have uh, uh, embarked on ourselves and then uh, we will be uh, uh, going to announce it uh, in in the recent uh, future i think it's all it's all finance that drives uh, all this infrastructure spend and i think manish uh, is the right person to tell uh, you know how has this new narrative esg climate change impacted and how crisil undertakes its ratings exercise is this now forming part of your standard rating rationale or uh, or assessment of uh, various financial instruments sure uh thanks uh, uh, abey for the question and thanks for having me on the panel too uh 
Yes, uh, ESG has kind of become a fat, uh, I mean, buzzword as of now. Uh, but if you look at from a risk assessment perspective for sustainable businesses, each of this, uh, the parameters of ESG, that is environmental sustainability and governance, they are any which way is uh, critical uh, for assessment of uh, uh, risk. Um, uh, so as Crystal, we had been factoring these aspects any which way uh, into the ratings. Like just to uh, share as an example over here, like if like, let's say a projects have uh, strong uh, emission parameters, or uh, uh, so the, the regulatory issues will be lesser for such kind of projects. So the regulatory interventions will be lesser uh, in, in those kind of projects. Similarly, like if there is a robust supply chain uh, mechanism and a very strong raw material sourcing, uh, which or sustainable raw material sourcing a company uh, builds, then again, uh, it will be a more sustainable operationally efficient uh, business. So that gets factored. And of course, we all know governance is the bedrock uh, for any risk assessment uh, per se. So all of these parameters were any which way as part of uh, risk assessment uh, when Crystal used to look at it. Uh, two things have happened uh, in between. One, uh, the disclosure norms uh, have changed. Uh, thanks to SEBI, uh, the BRSR requirements uh, which have come into play. Uh, today, I think a good, amount, good number of corporates are coming up with much stronger uh, disclosures around each of these parameters. And second uh, element that has happened is the fact that investors have become far more conscious about their investment in more uh, sense, uh, in ESG compliant kind of uh, projects. So these two elements have resulted in we also calling out uh, the ESG risk parameters in our rating assessment. Today, uh, something like 50% of our debt uh, that Crystal rates has a ESG call out uh, as well as part of uh, the ratings that we do. Uh, having said that, I think uh, the element that again is very important is the materiality of uh, ESG. We also look at the aspect related to like, if, if there is an issuer who's actually uh, accessing uh, global funds, ESG sensitive funds, so it's something which actually uh, helps uh, in terms of the call out of the ESG risk. It certainly improves uh, the, uh, the financial flexibility aspect uh, in the risk assessment, and that actually plays a very important role. So today, I think uh, uh, as for BRSR, uh, and similarly on the disclosure side, like as per BRSR, like SEBI has mandated that the top thousand corporates need to disclose uh, the ESG uh, terms. So we, we, we have begun uh, taking a note of that, uh, making a clear assessment. As this expands to other smaller companies as well, of course, uh, the, the rating span will also go uh, much stronger on, on that front. So from a corporate perspective, you know, it's there are standard disclosure norms, you have that information. Now, when you talk about urban infrastructure, how has been your experience with rating municipal instruments and how challenging it is? And, and if you put the complexity of climate change preparedness, it probably gets overwhelming, I would imagine. So what has been your experience while dealing with municipal finance instruments, like a municipal bond? Sure. Uh, before dealing with the fact of uh, climate sensitivity uh, for municipal, let's uh, look at uh, the whole municipal bond market, the context uh, for India, uh, per se. If I look at uh, uh, municipal bodies, they are the most important uh, elements to uh, really channelize uh, investment in urban infrastructure across any country. If I look at uh, countries like US and China, the municipal bond market over there is in excess of four to five trillion dollars. Even countries like South Africa uh, will have a bond market size of around one to one and a half trillion dollars. Uh, let's come to India uh, in that context. While investment requirements are large, but over last 25 years or so, the total municipal bond that has been uh, uh, that has uh, been put out by all municipal bodies put together is just 6,500 crores which is less than a billion dollar uh, to, to put it into context. Now, what has result, what, what, is, what is the reason why, why the bond markets have been uh, very small? I mean, one element when we do risk assessment for municipal bodies is the fact that uh, there is a lack of transparency uh, over there. Uh, there are elements uh, related to uh, uh, the, 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 the financing uh, norms uh, that the municipal bodies are following. There is a 
disparity around that. While there is some bit of a semblance that has been brought out by uh, the central government victims in RBI, but still there is a disparity uh, around that. There is a lack of trust because uh, there is uh, uh, very limited issuances that come out. So there are not many frequent issuers uh, of, of bond over here. And similarly, uh, if, and for some of these reasons, and if you look at it, the number of municipal bodies who are attaining uh, uh, the rating levels, which actually enable them to access uh, bond markets has been uh, relatively lesser. So these are some of the things that uh, we are seeing. Uh, having said that, like we have seen pockets of issuances um, uh, in some of the municipal bodies, Ghaziabad, Indore, some of these uh, municipal bodies have issued green bonds uh, very recently. And, uh, and that's also a fallout of the kind of uh, intervention Government of India is doing uh, on some of these parameters. Uh, there are incentive schemes that have been put out, uh, which actually uh, incentivizes uh, municipal bodies to go to the market and uh, raise bonds. The, the, the scheme is also to actually improvise on some of their uh, disclosure norms, the, the management, etc. So that also is something which is helping. But as a proportion of overall bond, it still remains very small, uh, is, is what I can say. So, so that is what uh, we are presently seeing. But uh, having said that, uh, sustainable infrastructure uh, projects, I think uh, that's, that will remain very, very important uh, going forward. Uh, there is a need to develop uh, that market as well. And I think uh, the, some of the steps which the Government of India is taking in this regard are uh, the relevant ones uh, as we move forward. Thanks, Manish. I think you brought out the challenges of uh, municipal finance, which has been an age-old problem. Uh, to the fore. And I just want to come back to Mother when he talked about Mumbai as, you know, able to take steps. But also Mumbai is one of the richest municipal bodies in the country and it has got the resources. So, you know, is financial capacity allowing them to cope with the challenges better? Or are we seeing some cities which are not so financially well endowed, but also trying to do something good? So, yeah, I mean, Clearly, uh, you know, I mean, other, most cities have tremendous challenges on the financial side and, uh, you know, this is a big area of work that is required. I mean, we've been doing some work in Solapur and they stuck with an hardco loan from like what, 15 years ago. And just, you know, it's, it's, it's very hard to get out of these things. It's a similar to the DISCOM problem, right? So, I think uh, so there is legacy issues plus there is no revenue sources so it's a very very complicated issue. Uh, Mumbai I think uh, that way I mean I mean today see in Mumbai even MCGM is confidently saying if there is a 200 mm rain day we will city will function which other city in the country is you know able to deal with a 200 mm rain day today. For the matter any which other city in the world would well, do. Yeah. In fact, one interesting exercise, you know, we've, you know, we've been helping Mumbai with the climate action plan and climate budgeting. So we, you know, got invited to a cohort. I mean, Mumbai got invited to the cohort we've been supporting with, with Oslo and New York. And uh, there were six other countries. Uh, and Mumbai was really the most equipped on adaptation, on flood, on resilience, the kind of disaster management institution that has been set up. And in the end, it ended up that they were actually taking the lead on sort of certain exercises on, especially this was around climate budgeting on the adaptation side. Uh, so, so there is clearly, I think a lot of learning, especially dealing with floods. Again, heat is a separate issue. Just on floods, I think there's a lot of capacity and I think which even, you know, hasn't been sort of, uh, you know, uh, learned internally. Uh, so that's the, so point being that, uh, you know, uh, there are two things. It's not just the budget, right? I mean, it's the ability, the, again, the, the third level of governance, right? The How well the sort of awards function, the power that a ward officer has. So it is money, but it is also the sort of institutionalization and that next level of governance. Just the fact that if Mumbai has 2000 engineers, you know, Solapur will have 20, it doesn't work, right? I mean, so that, again, that capacity in, in also in, is also required. So my point is that, uh, going back to your original question, even if money is there, I think uh, especially to respond to climate change, you know, do things and you need a lot of distributed action. And so you need that next level of governance 
in place functioning that is what also allows you to sort of you know respond positively to to the both on the planning side but also on the disaster side so i would say that that's so not only so that is also missing right pretty much if you leave you know maybe gujarat and a few cities in maharashtra i think that is something we have also seen a lot of places struggle with is that sort of you know next level of governance uh, and that is equally important as is sort of putting in place you know better finance so you know we had cities you not know, facing challenges of financing and if put layer of climate change it becomes far more uh, demanding and we are expecting that you know that the investments in the urban infrastructure space over the next 6 years is going to be almost double what has happened in the last 5 years so given that that we have to build resilient infrastructure i just want dr mahesh to talk about the concept of you know resilience dividend you know we always talk about demographic dividend and I, what i found very very exciting and very innovative is the uh, the concept of resilience uh, dividend and maybe i think if you can talk a little bit more about it i think it it's be very good um thank you for bringing it up uh, recently on october 4th uh, cdri did launch a report uh, title resilience dividend uh, it is global infrastructure resilience index and the report mainly focused on uh, how countries are uh, you know what is the extent of losses which countries are experiencing and what is the probabilistic loss which countries are expected to experience over the next 30 years given the impact of uh, you know the climate extremes and uh, what they need to do in terms of uh, investments to address this uh, particular challenge globally there are different figures you know $1 invested you have a $4 return uh, on that investment in terms of the dividend uh, resilience dividend some say 6 uh, while this number varies significantly because uh, you whatever is done uh in terms of at the early stage of planning and design has a cascading effect we talk about uh, resilient infrastructure uh, which i did talk about in the first part that is can the infrastructure withstand the extremities of the climate uh and then there is something called uh, resilient in, uh, infrastructure which is like whatever infrastructure we build is it catering positively to the society it is is it catering positively to the economic development is it catering positively to ensure that uh, you know the poor and the vulnerable are safeguarded uh, so it is not that you build a road and then the road becomes the factor or the leading cause of flooding around that particular area it is the road should of course cater to the development and uh, cater to the mobility uh, ease of access uh, to certain uh, you know resources but at the same time it should be sustainable and it should also lead to the promotion of sustainability around that particular area um so there is a lot of factors i think the most important thing which we need to take into consideration is uh, it, the question is not whether we uh, should invest in the development of infrastructure or not uh, i think we have overcome that debate we for any city or country to grow we need to invest in infrastructure but are we investing in it sensibly so that whatever the life of that infrastructure is uh, basically the infrastructure caters minimum period you see around like we build keep building roads every 2 or 3 years we keep relaying it that's not how it's supposed to be in terms of buildings uh, you actually end up spending lot more on maintenance over the 25 or 50 year life of the building than the cost of the building um, the same happens to our service networks you know we construct drain and we end up spending more on o and m of the drain uh, than on the construction of the drain so these are factors which we need to take into account and usually when we uh, what we are very good at us we are very good at capex even with the current planning government uh, schemes which are coming up we are very very good at capex but we fail on opex you know we don't know how to monitor and maintain these infrastructure assets properly or we do a better planning so that we don't spend that much on operation and maintenance and that's where the resilience dividend is whatever you invest today 
you get the value for money over the long period of time rather than keep reinvesting on the same asset over and over again. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh. I want you to just link this, what you said, and what you talked about, uh, you know, something what I call contingent liability. You know, when we look at as finance professions, we look at contingent liability on the government's books as, you know, you want a PPP transaction, what are the claims on guarantees or the money that they should pay. What is coming out is that in the era of climate change, any infrastructure that is going to be built is going to have climate change impacts on it. There are going to be losses on that. And, and if that infrastructure is not planned correctly, there is a contingent liability that resides in the books of the government uh, in terms of actually maintaining that uh, infrastructure or repairing the infrastructure or getting it right. Because if it's not planned right, uh, with, with resilience kept in mind, there is a liability that comes on the government. So I think we are going to see an era where contingent liability is going to take a new dimension in if the infrastructure is not planned correctly. So, you know, uh, so I think it's an important point that the resilient dividend talks about. I think we talked about I think if if there is no resilient dividend, there is no going to there is not going to be any demographic uh, dividend. You know, it's it's coming out as that. So, Mr. Kumaran, uh, in terms of uh, you know green buildings, you know how can that become a new normal? You know, rather than being an exception, is there anything that can be done to make sure that our all our buildings which are planned in our cities are green buildings? Uh. Abhay, that's an excellent uh, question. I would split this into two parts. One is, as your colleague who was telling that uh, when, when the ask for quality funds become uh, a mandate, even the ESG become a mandate. So one, uh, if you are looking for good quality investment, you need to get into uh, Grisby ESG norms uh, by default. One is uh, that. Second is, uh, when uh, certain governments in India itself, they gave a uh, lot of uh, relaxation in terms of either a lead or a griha rating. If you if you get three or uh, gold, you will get 3% to 5% of, of uh, uh, the base FIR increase. There was also a push so that from a statutory point of view, you are uh, uh, given uh, credit to... Uh, do green building. The third one, which I say, these two, I will put it uh, in a uh, in a statutory uh, bucket or what you are supposed to do. The third one is the separate uh, bucket in terms of sustainability. I think what you need to do is is to have good quality, uh, efficient, and also uh, buildings which breathe themselves good indoor air quality. Uh, also, uh, reducing operational uh, uh, cost. Uh, one of the points which Dr. Mahesh was telling that CapEx, everyone is good, but it's the uh, OPEX. So if, if uh, a green building is built, the co operational cost is, is considerably less. And I can tell from our own fact that it's uh, 30 to 35 percent uh, less only in, in uh, uh, power. And uh, water is also uh, the same in, in that range. It's going to be the norm. I think if, if many have not adopted, they will they will miss the bus. It's already the norm uh, is what I can uh, think of. So that's good to know. Uh, I think uh, we've discussed uh, many issues. Uh, we still have seven and a half minutes left. So if there are any questions from the audience side, any comments, uh, uh, you are welcome to uh, raise your hand and uh, and ask your question, please. Any questions? I think it's all clear for the audience. Uh, all comments are also welcome.
So I think, uh, you know, uh, I think the points that have been discussed uh, have been quite illuminating. Uh, what is emerging from the discussion is cities have had a challenging uh, past and with climate change, uh, they are going to be having a much more uh, challenging, uh, you know, future. And finance is going to be very critical uh, and we have to address that. There are various solutions that we have been prescribed from time and again that probably needs to be uh, looked at. Uh, we also need to look at that what uh, Dr. Mahesh talked about, about the, uh, you know, resilience dividend is today is that whenever there is an economic uh, projections or GDP projections, we have to see whether our, our, are our investments also, uh, you know, resiliently planned. So I'm just thinking about uh, uh, school algebra uh, of simultaneous equations, where we say the GDP is equal to consumption plus government expenditure plus uh, net exports plus investments. That has to be also qualified by the fact that the resilience dividend is there, where one is planning for infrastructure uh, with uh, with a resilience uh, component built into it, and which is able to withstand the the given losses. You now losses are taken now for climate change are going to be there. So I think economists are going to be asked the question: Is are your GDP projections uh, factoring the resilience element? Or is that element residing on the books of government as a contingent liability? I think this complexity is something I think we don't have an answer. Probably new models will need to be structured uh, for doing this. But do we have the data to, uh, you know, to measure this? I think these are the challenges that climate change uh, uh, imposes. And maybe uh, Madhav, uh, you know, in your experience, is data available even for a city like Mumbai? Uh, is data available on the ground? I mean, data is I mean is is a struggle. I mean, data and then data in which is can be used is is equally challenging. But I think uh, again it depends. I mean, I think uh, today uh, open source is becoming uh, you know there's a lot of sort of like I said, geospatial data is become available that has created opportunities that did not exist. Um, uh, but uh, there, there are huge missing pieces. I mean, one of the data sets, I mean, uh, even like the GST data is not being made public. I mean, if you were to really start talking about city and the economy, I mean, that data becomes a crucial piece, right? But today we don't, we are not even able to establish what is the GDP of a city. Right? So I think, uh, I think some of these pieces will become extremely important in the time to come for it to become public. And I think some right steps have been done, but uh, with GST, etc. But I think that needs to be mainstreamed further. So my point is that, uh, and then the ability, right, within the, uh, you know, uh, or within the government setup, or, or to be able to sort of, you know, use this data. That's one way. The other is the whole issue of standards, protocols. How do we build APIs, you know, so that, you know, I mean, I think uh, that becomes extremely important in this sort of, I mean, how do you make sure that whatever data is there, that is, you know, the personalization is there's authentication. I mean, so, so I think uh, whether some amount of work on standardization protocols, so, so yeah, there's a, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done on data. Again, like I said, I think a uh, lot of possibilities that we can demonstrate for now, but mainstreaming is, is exactly. still a long way. Yeah. yeah. But I think the good thing is that the government has recognized, as Dr. Mahesh talked about, that urban planning, uh, you know, is a challenge. And we had a high level committee on urban planning, which has really, you know, uh, set the ball rolling. And, and uh, so Dr. Mahesh, do you want to add something on that? Or? Yeah, there is a lot of positive things which are emerging. Uh, it's just that it's not happening at the scale we want it to happen or at the pace we want it to happen. Because the challenges which we are facing today uh, is enormous because for the next 20 years, we are going to invest more in our infrastructure, in our development. And all of us are also going to invest in our own health and well-being and lifestyle. So. 
it is important that whatever we do invest it is safeguarded against the future extremities also it takes into consideration the future extremities so that what we do is in a sustainable manner i think that is the challenge it is not that good cases don't exist there are good examples but i think they are very few we need more of them uh, we need more scalability and uh, that kind of scale cannot be done by one single organization or we can't just expect the government doing it and that's why these kinds of forums with public private uh, and also academia is much much more important to identify means and measures to scale it i think the private sector is much much more adaptable and flexible to do the scaling up uh, than the government in many cases uh, so i think uh, it's a give and take uh, for uh, all but i'm uh, i'm hopeful and also positive that uh, you know if we are able to uh, do that in the next 10 years or showcase that uh, scaling up in the next 10 years i think uh, uh, we we have a lot more to gain uh, in the process thank so i think uh, you know kumar uh, kumaran talked about that green buildings can become a new normal uh, we see that there are solutions which are prevailing in the country but probably need to scalable. And Dr. Mahesh also talked about that when there was this crisis, they got people together. And I just read some quote where Winston Churchill talked about saying that a crisis is a good opportunity to change. And probably that there is a consensus today in the country amongst all stakeholders that we are facing a crisis. And probably the silver lining of this crisis that it would probably propel us to change. So on this, uh, uh, you know, uh, positive note and hoping for a brighter and less hotter, uh, uh, sub, uh, you know, uh, climate. Uh, we hope that climate change ceases to be a burning issue in the coming decade. So thank you all for uh, coming and uh, sharing your perspectives. I think it has left definitely uh, uh, has enlightened us and also given us some hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Abhay, and all the eminent panelists. Some of the very pertinent issues were discussed. I would now request our panel moderator, Mr. Abhay Kandak, to please felicitate the panelists with the certificates of tree plantation. Uh, Mr. Madhav Pai, CEO, WRI India. Dr. Uma Maheshwaram Raja Shekhar, Urban Resilience Advisor, CDRI. And Mr. W. R. Kumaran, EDDLF Power and Services. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Mr. Manish Gupta, Deputy uh, Chief Ratings Officer and Dean, uh, Senior Director, Crystal Ratings, for uh, attending the panel and giving his views. Thank you all for the for this uh, wonderful discussion, ladies and gentlemen. With this, we proceed towards the vote of thanks. As per the planned agenda, we come to the close of the three panels for the day where we discussed on green capital, sustainable, sustainable transportation and sustainable urban infra. I would now like to invite Mr. Suresh Krishnamurthy, Business Head and Senior Director, Crystal Research and Consulting on the stage for a vote of thanks. Suresh, please. Thank you, Gurantil. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Crystal, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you for attending our India Infrastructure Conclave event today. It's an absolute pleasure to host such a distinguished group of people who are passionate about the India infrastructure growth story. 
I hope your time spent here listening to our speakers touch upon the macro and micro factors dominating the Indian infrastructure landscape was productive. I'm confident that you would all be returning with valuable insights and actionable ideas. On behalf of Crystal, I also want to thank our distinguished panel of experts and industry captains for their participation, support, and enriching views. I'm looking forward to your feedback, and we will use it to improve our future seminars. We would like you to stay connected with us through our social media handles, emails, and in person. I also want to thank my Crystal team for organizing this edition of the Conclave. I once again thank you all and hope to see you in the next Crystal event. Thank you. Thanks, Suresh. With this, ladies and gentlemen, we bring today's proceedings to a close. As requested by Suresh and everybody, we, would we look forward to your feedback. So please, for those who haven't provided it, please scan the QR code on the tent cards on your table, or you can use the physical paper kept on your table to please provide your feedback. I would now like to thank each and every one of you for joining us here and being such a wonderful audience. Let me also take this opportunity once again to thank all our esteemed speakers for their valuable time and inputs. Thank you, everybody. May I request uh, all my colleagues from Crystal to please kindly stay back uh, while the rest of the audience can please proceed towards uh, the TN, uh, TND closure. Thank you.